I don't know what we can talk about in this nation without talking about white superiority, honestly. Who defines the meaning of God also defines the relationship between economy and God. African Americans spent $1.3 trillion last year, making us the 16th wealthiest nation in the world. Why have we not turned those riches into wealth to develop our community? Peace family. Um, I'm so happy to be um, here tonight. We have some um, big, like happy news that we're about to, um, you know, uh, tell everybody about in a couple of minutes. And we have Professor James Small and Chester Higgins, who are both actually happy cast members. They have such rich lives. We're about to get into it. In fact, I was talking to uh, Mr. Higgins beforehand and um, I was like, we got to stop talking because <laughs> we got to save some for this, um, so, you know, for this broadcast. Uh, but before we get started, I just want to give some shout outs to um, everyone in the chat. I see Michelle Jewell, uh, Rob Moses, um, Energy is in the house, and DM. DM is always like our first person, but Julie, Julie got you this time. So peace to you guys. Um, it's so nice to uh, be joining you. I am actually in Dakar right now in Senegal. So this is like really um, pretty cool to be, you know, globally talking to you guys. And um, it's really a treat to sit down with these two guys. So um, one of the things, um, oh, and light, light bringer. Oh, I like your name. That's nice. So one of the things um, that I just want to, you know, share with you guys when we talk about the evolution of happy talks, right? So we were scheduled to open up um, and screen the, um, the happy full length documentary, which is two hours and 12 minutes. We were actually um, set to screen it at the Schomburg in New York City. But, um, you know, due to COVID, we had to put that on hold. And so, you know, we didn't want to like lose the momentum that Happy was, you know, was giving us. So we started to, you know, think about ways that we could still stay connected to our audience. Like, okay, you're like, okay, you know what, we'll just uh, interview uh, someone, interview someone from, from the movie, the movie, the documentary, the documentary every week, and every just have a conversation. conversation. And, you know, it's just like a talk. So we just call it Happy Talks. So what has happened though, Happy Talks has taken on, like it has its own identity. And sometimes people don't actually know that we actually have a documentary. And so from time to time, we always have to let people know like, hey, we got a documentary, we got a documentary. Um, you know, cause it was always our intention to release this movie on the road. Well, today is the day that we are announcing the official Hoppy Tour, okay? So we are going to hopefully a city near you, okay? We are starting out with five cities, okay? And I'm gonna get them uh, up on the screen so you can see um, the five cities and it's gonna be very exciting. So if you guys have you know, purchased uh, like t-shirts, which I have one on today, you know, t-shirts or you have any type of hoppy gear, you need to just uh, wear it and come on out to the screening. And so let me, I'm going to share this page with you so we can see all the cities we're going to, which is exciting. Okay. There it is right there. All right. So we are hitting, we're going to Detroit. Things, my hometown, we're kicking things off in Detroit. That is September 26th which is a Sunday. Then we're going to head to Philly. Peace to Philly um, crew. I know Michael Friend is from Philly, um, one of my mentors. So um, peace to you. We come into your city. And then we're going to hit Houston, Texas. Then we're going to go to D.C. And we have some really good treats in D.C. Because, And I have to also um, mention that after each screening, we will have a panel discussion. So who knows? And when I say who knows, like really, who knows? Who's going to come into, you know, uh, be part of this um, you know, screening. So it's very important that you guys buy a ticket and come. And then lastly, we're going to end in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Now, I know you're probably thinking like, if you live in some cities, you're like, well, my city's not there. We are still actually working on other cities. So you have to stay tuned. Um, you want to make sure that you are signed up to our newsletter or, and get onto our mailing list. So anytime we add a city, then you guys can, you know, you'll know firsthand and you can get your tickets. Um, if you go to Happy Film right now, you can purchase your ticket if you're in any of those cities. 
Things are limited, guys, because of COVID. So I would suggest, I know it's just like when we were talking about Aket tours and we're talking about this trip to Egypt. And I think people thought it was a marketing, you know, like a marketing thing that we were like, oh, limited seats. No, no, they were limited. <laughs> we're almost actually out of them. So we are telling you, if you want to come and check us out, um, it's going to be so, um, so much fun. Um, please, please, please get your ticket now. And I see some people repping their cities in the um, in the chat. And Boston was one of the places because Boston is actually the um, uh, the Museum of Fine Arts is actually in the film. Um, but we have not been able to secure a location. So this is the thing. If you are in a city, OK, and you have access to a theater or can put us in touch with somebody, give us a, um, you know, a shout out on any of our social medias. You can DM us or you can actually you can just um, go to. Um, to um, happyfilm.com and leave us uh, where it says get, get connected, you can leave a message there. You can also um, email us at the info hoppy at film, uh, .com. Um, You know, um, I'm sorry, hap, info hoppy film at gmail.com. You can email us there and, uh, you know, let us know because we are definitely trying to be up in all these cities. We need for you guys to show up and show out. It's going to be fabulous finally getting um, a chance to connect with everybody. And, uh, you know, don't worry. All these places uh, require us to have masks. So we will have, you know, those. And it is, that's why I'm saying it's limited seating. <laughs> so make sure, family, you come out to support. You know, we've, this is what we have been waiting for to get on the road with this film. And we want to see you guys. So it's lovely that you guys are on like the chat and, and um, showing us a lot of social media love. But we need to see you guys. You know, we need to fist, you know, elbow bump, fist bump, hug, whatever we need to do. But we need to see you guys in person. Um, so please, 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 like I said, if you're in a city that um, we do not have up here, um, please, please, please make sure that you reach out to us and see if you can put us in contact with someone. I will tell you that Tampa will be available, Tampa, Florida, uh, next week. So um, look out for Tampa to be added. Um and you can go, like I said, go to uh, happyfilm.com and get your, uh, you know, uh, get your ticket. The other piece is that um, it, it's so important that, you know, the tickets are moderately priced. And if you can, bring a young person, you know, um, or bring someone who you think just needs to just see something different. If this is not, you know, like something that they, uh, you know, that they would normally um, check out. Make sure you come out and, you know, we will have all of our, you know, merchandise where you can get stuff. But, um, you know, it's important that we just see you guys in the house. And just, a, you know, a, a little reminder of who is in this film. Like I said, we have two of uh, the cast members here tonight, but that's everyone. We have somebody, we have a little of everybody up in this film. So please, please, please. This is Taki, uh, Taki Grant's third feature length film. Third, okay, and the cool thing about this is that Chester Higgins, um, he does a lot of work with um, Tahuti Films, Robert C. Uh, Gay, and uh, his production company, Tahuti Films, was also the producers of Hoppy, him and his wife. So it's beautiful images, um, you know, Seed is prides himself on making things look beautiful. Um, so please come out and, and, you know, check out this film. Let's go to Happy Film. Dot com and get your ticket. All right. And uh, yes, DC is in the house. Yes, yes, yes. So also, um, and yes, Donnie Williams is asking. So we are screening Happy, the role of economics in the development of civilization, the whole entire documentary. It's two hours and 12 minutes. Okay. Um, and it's really nice. One of the guests uh, that we have tonight, Professor James Small, he opens it up, uh, he opens up Hoppy and he closes Hoppy, which is really nice. So we have um, some, we have a really good show planned for you guys. All right. Now, the next thing is the, the Egypt tour, okay? We are, we may have to do a, something different just to, to accommodate more people coming, but this is your time if you have not you know, looked at this. This is a, a good like Christmas gift, a bucket list. It's all of those things, but it's a pilgrimage that we are taking to um, uh, to Egypt next year in February. So it's really important if you can make it happen for you to you know just check it out 
and um, and see all the good stuff that you know is going to be going on. I'm just going to show the promo real quick, and then we're going to go get go ahead and get started with our with our show. Want to travel to Egypt with Hoppy? Since 1999, Akhet Tours has featured some of the most culturally dynamic tours to Egypt. Taki Grant, the director of the award-winning documentary film Hoppy, is also the CEO and founder of Akhet Tours. As part of our 23rd anniversary trip to the Nile, Akhet Tours is hosting an extraordinary first-of-its-kind tour that includes nightlife on the Nile. This expedition is geared towards the savvy traveler seeking an intellectually stimulating experience and a good time. Visitors will check into a hand-picked chartered luxury cruise exclusively for our group. By day, we will visit the pyramids, and at night, we will party under the cosmos as we sail up the Nile. Come experience historical landmarks that have stood the test of time. For more information, please visit our website at www.aketours.com. You can also email us at aketours at gmail.com. Yes, 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 yes. So um, I'm going to put that up so you guys can um, see the webs. The I'm sorry. Um, yeah, you can go check out the website. Look around. We have lots of pictures and all types of stuff. There's a website, iCatTours.com. And, um, and Ronnie from uh, the Temple of Anu, he, yes, and his wife, Ak. Uh, yes, I didn't forget Ak. Uh, uh, actually, if you look into some of our pictures and um, our happy, like social media pictures, you'll see her right there with her husband um, handling that camera like, um, like a straight up queen of Africa. So definitely, um, you know, they are a, a, a beautiful duo making it happen. So uh, yes, it's Akhet Tours, you know, go check it out. Okay, and this is just a website, again, happyfilm.com, or you can email us. If we are not in your city, okay, if your city ain't one of those um, five and Tampa's gonna be six, you guys got to, you know, look around, see somebody who has a theater space so that we can show Hoppy and, um, you know, get us connected so we can make it happen. All right. Um, okay. I want to also say peace to Hunter Adams, uh, who is in the house. And, you know, that's, uh, it, it's interesting because, you know, he must have, um, uh, you know, Professor Adams, you, you, your ears must be burning because I was just talking to you with our, with our guest. And I was saying how I really appreciated the show that you did with Dr. Renoko Rashidi and Anthony Browder. It was really nice to, to hear you guys talking about, you know, what real brotherhood has looked like, you know, for the last 40 something years. So that's what's up. All right. So without further ado, I am going to bring in Professor James Small and Chester Higgins. And let me tell you, um, like I said, Professor James Small, he opens up Hoppy and he closes Hoppy. So he has um, been one of our number one, like major supporters. Um, Taki has leaned into him and um, Infudishi and Dr. Jeffries in terms of crafting and coming up with the whole concept of what you guys are going to see if you come to, you know, um, to one of the cities and check us out. Um, so it's, it's always a treat when he comes in, you know, because he always kind of lays stuff down. Now, Chester Higgins, it's beautiful in the film because he has a very nice voice, okay? And um, it's, it's, he has one of those like Anthony Browder, velveteen little voices um, and such a soft smoking man, but he has done so many things. He's, he has eight books and he's going to share with us tonight his eighth book, actually, The Sacred Now. So without further ado, Professor James Small and Mr. Chester Higgins, how are you guys doing? Good, Sister Felicia. Hello, happy family. Hello, hello. Good to be here. Yeah. Yes, it's so good to have you guys here. Um, yeah, there's yeah, the, right there. Hunter was right there, Mr. Uh, Professor Adams. So um, before we get started, I just want you guys um, to just, you know, give some uh, reflections or thoughts about Dr. Uh, Renoke Rashidi before we get started. You can tell a story or just anything you want to share with us about Dr. Rashidi. I defer to uh, Professor Smalls because he knew him. I knew him forever, but we don't have any stories. He's always <laughs> doing business, you know, being <clears throat> at different places, at different conferences, or watching his photos. Um, I would just like to um, wish him a safe journey. He, he's on his way um, back to the ancestors. Um, our culture, the Akan culture particularly, says it's a 40-day journey, um, a part of that nine 40 day blocks that we call our calendar year in the archon and what we refer to as a quesi die 
for this 40 days, we'll all pour some libation to him. And then after that, every 40 days, remember him. Um, Renoko will probably, not probably, he competed, completed his work here. Whatever promise he made to God, he more than fulfilled him. So I don't know whether we'll see him back again. Um, he'll become, in our tradition, an Orisha, an angel, an Obosun, a Loas, one of the forces that we will turn to <coughs> in our consciousness to move to the next level. So safe journey, brother. I enjoyed the time we had down here with you for 60 something years. Um, you're back with the universe, which has no time limits on it. Peace and blessings. And as the, in the, in the Akan tradition, uh, his passing means a great tree has fallen. Yes. It, but that tree, the, the leaves of that tree left behind so many books and left behind such a presence on the web of his uh, unabashed uh, love for himself and for his people. And that we're, we're, we're proud of. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. You know, uh, we we were talking early, um, you know, about this idea of brotherhood. Can you guys just talk about how you know each other and how long you well, know each other? I, I think, well, my first knowledge of Dr. Smalls was when um, the uh, City College and Dr. Jeffries had invited uh, the Asante Henny, the, the, the king of the Ashantis, uh, Opakawari uh, to uh, New York. Uh, I had um, lived in Ghana uh, the summers of 72 and 73 and, and had friends there. And I knew of, um, of the Ashantis, but I had never been to Kumasi. I spent most of my time in the north, but I, you can't be in Ghana and not know about the Ashantis. So uh, this, when I heard that the, the Asante hinting was coming, uh, I was really moved and I was so happy that it was happening and they had these activities, these public activities, outdooring activities at City College that I went and photographed. And uh, also, um, I think the last one was a uh, a procession uh, down Central Park West to, to the uh, Museum of Natural History, uh, I believe. Uh, and then, um, <clears throat> so then uh, later I, had a chance to meet Dr. Smalls when he was living near the college. Uh, but I've always been impressed with his sense of certitude and his sense of, um, of, of, of righteous indignation uh, and understanding of, uh, of, uh, of the value of, uh, of our people. Yes, yes, yes. And, 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 Brother Chester got a better memory than me. I don't know how, all I know, I've always known Chester Higgins. You know what I mean? he, he's just always there. He was the first one that brought me a, a, a document to sign. So he, he, he took my picture. And I oh, 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 it oh yes. And I, I signed it. It, yeah. it was years later when I realized what I signed. I oh, no, at least. Yes, at least. Because you. <clears throat> when I make pictures, I tell people, look, you know, I may or may not ever publish this picture, but yeah. I can't unless I have your permission. Yeah. So, <laughs> and I remember, you know, just, I want you to know, you're the only person I've ever signed that permission with. Oh, well, thank you for trusting me. <laughs> I, didn't even, I didn't even sign <clears throat> happy. I said, nope. Okay. Yeah, well, thank I'm you. the only one that did not sign a release with you, partner. <laughs> oh, so let me oh, yeah. the occasion that uh Chester was talking about, I want to add some background. Uh Atumpo Pokawari was the Asantehini, the king of king of the Ashanti nation. And we heard Dr. Jeffries and I that he was coming to America. And this would have been the first time that an African king would mm. be coming. There may have been a few have come in, but not as as they are king, not as a king, but as a guest on vacation or something. And we didn't know he was here. But this time he was coming as a guest of the Museum of Natural History or the Metropolitan Museum of Art, one of those. I think Metropolitan Museum of Art that had an exhibit that was being brought from England called the Mountain of Gold. Well, I went off about it and said, 
this is stolen gold. <laughs> why don't the British give us our gold back? <laughs> and why would our king come over here to validate this? Well, somehow this got back to um, Ghana, to the Asante. And um, uh, someone is calling me. If you tell them to text so me. I, I've got to do that because it's family. And if you don't, please text me. Yeah, um, you need to know why they're calling you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, when I made that statement, there was another man. I won't call his name. He's an ancestor now who somehow was in some intrigue with that museum, who was angry with Dr. Jeffries and Dr. Clark for fighting them over the exhibit of King Tut that had been here earlier. <laughs> so the word gets back to God <clears throat> that I threatened the life of Santa Henry. Wow. The story. So most people don't know the story, but I'm going to tell it publicly for history. So one day, Dr. Jeffries and I, before he comes, gets invited to the home of a Ghanaian person in Harlem. So we went and we took another younger brother, Lionel, with us. When we got to this home in Harlem on 7th Avenue, we found ourselves surrounded by armed men. And we were told that we had made a threat on the life of the King of Kings. This is a true story. And so they were holding a trial for me and Leonard Jeffries. And of course, I'd come in at the Almeida Beret, some dark shades. I think I had my locks. Oh, so my I'm God. Looking, looking a bit like Jerry Rollins. And this particular group didn't give a darn about Jerry. <laughs> right? And so we are in this room. And they told me to have a seat. And I thought, nah, I'm not sitting anywhere. I'm standing with my back against the wall. I'm gangster. I know what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> Dr. J is sitting down. Dr. J don't drink. He was so scared. They hand him a Heineken, and he was killing that Heineken. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't take any drinks. The other brother, they moved him over to the side, to the corner. And then out come oh. these two men who would become like fathers and uncles to me and Dr. Jeffries later. But at this time, here comes Mr. Ando, the secretary to Santa Ando, Mr. Ando. You know, I know. You know, I know. Boy, but that was tough. Yeah, right? yeah. And then the second one was Bafo Okutu, the linguist for Santa Hini, the hit man himself. Right? <clears throat> So they began to do the interrogation. Huh? Interrogation? So they put us on trial since so this shit was real. We, they, somebody had falsely told them that we had threatened the life of their king. And they sent a squad to America to handle it. Okay? So we're in this room in our neighborhood, in our, on our 7th Avenue, being jacked up by some dudes from Ghana, right? So I'm pissed. So I wait to go last. So they they they, uh, they question Dr. Jeffries. Dr. Jeffries laid his thing out. No, I didn't say this. This is what I said. And Bafo was recounting things because he's a linguist, so he remembers every word, every detail. Uh, Mr. Andal sitting there looking like he about to chop us into minced meat. Then there's all these other guys there, right? So. I know a little bit about the culture. So as I'm looking around the room, I see a guy back in the kitchen who I know as a former Ghanaian student of mine who now works at the UN. And so when they called for me to testify, I said, I'm not speaking to you in English. I said, that man back there I know, bring him forward. I will speak to him in English. He will be my linguist. He will speak to you in tree. Otherwise, I don't have a conversation with you. I was scared as hell, but I said, this is the time not to be scared. This is the time to say, okay, mano a mano, let's do this, right? So <laughs> that's the way it goes. <laughs> and so I tell them that the way the story had been given back was not what really happened. That we had said the greatest thing to happen to Black America 
was that our king was coming. And it is the most honored thing that could possibly happen to have a king come. But we felt that this occasion where they had this stolen gold from, that England had stolen from our people, that they should give the gold back to Ghana. And that we should not give glorification to that. But we would honor our king and celebrate our king because never before had a king come to black America. So when we got finished and the back and forth and the back and forth, they said, okay, you can leave. Dr. J was up and out of the door. <laughs> <laughs> was up and out of the door. Me, I ain't going nowhere. You're going to bring my butt up in here, jack me up, threaten me, then you're going to be sitting down to a bowl of foo-foo. Ain't happening like that. <laughs> he's at the table by now. The lady brought him his food. I get down on my knees, and I tell him, I know who you are. And he turns to me and says, and I know who you are. Oh. And then we just stared at each other. And then he goes, I want to eat my food. Now you go. <laughs> <laughs> this is ba Bafo Okotu, who I love with all my heart. So I leave. Whew, we get out of there alive because we realize the seriousness of the moment. About two days later, they find out who the culprit really is. Mm. So we're at City College, me and Dr. Jeffers, in front of the NAC. When three lemos pull up, and all of these chiefs and linguists come out in full traditional clothing. And they came and apologized and told us they had found out who the boy was that had created this confusion around the, the exhibit coming to the museum. And they said, don't worry, we will take care of him. Oh. He didn't go back to Ghana for years, but when he went back, he went to prison and he never came out. So, fast so good. So, but here's what I did. I'm still pissed, right? So I told Dr. Jeffries, I accept the apology. These are kings. I love them. And now we set into place the first Durba in America, working with other Ghanaian associations, oh. the Sentiment Association, uh, Nana Sapang um, from Agogo, um, with the Ga. Uh, a Dangbei Kipi Association with the Ebe Hobobo, all the different Ghanaian Association. Um, and we created the first Durba. A Durba is a stadium full of people, thousands of people on the south campus of City College, where the king presents himself to the public. It's one of the most beautiful, and you see all of these chiefs with their umbrellas and the drumming and the nothing like that had ever happened in America before. And nothing on that scale has ever happened since, even though we've had smaller Derby since. This was our king coming to America on the real. Wow. The king of kings. No white folks or black folks had ever seen nothing like this in America. And so, and just to remember that day when we were marching down Fifth Avenue going to the museum, and I had my baby, my son Agnaton was a little boy. It was about a few months old. And I had the baby with me. We marching, Mayor Cox and all of us coming down there. And when I left the museum, I went home to find out that my father had passed that afternoon about oh. 3 p.m. And I was supposed to be there at 3 p.m. He told me to come, be here tomorrow at 3 p.m. I said, what time do you want me back? He said, 3 p.m. And I, I didn't get there until five because the thing I remember with the parade, it got held up and it took us a while to get to the museum and to get out of the museum. So when I got to the hospital, it was oh. five. And they told me, oh, your father has gone. But we spent that day before together. So he gave me the things he wanted me to have, wisdom oh. and otherwise. But the other part of the story, and then I'll end the story. I'm still upset with this dude coming to Harlem thugging me, right? So I tell Dr. J, we're not taking this shit. So we went and bought tickets to Ghana, got on the plane, flew what? to Afra, got on the plane, flew to Kamasi, six o'clock in the morning, we're knocking on Bafo's door. Boom, 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 right? So a lady comes to the door and we tell him who we are. Then Bafo comes to the door in his bathrobe. He's shocked. Oh, <laughs> he invites us in the house. I said, yes, I'm coming to your house. 
You came to my house, now I'm coming to your house. From that moment on, Dr. Jeffries, myself, and that man was family, fused together like steel. And Mr. Anna also, Anna Santahini, took us like we were his children. Anytime we went to Kamasi, he gave audience to us, to our children, to our families. Um, His sister, who is the mother of the current of Santahini, we eat on her porch and her steps, you know. it was just such a beautiful friendship that grew out of that negative situation, this beautiful education oh. process on African culture. And that's what I was doing on the Carl Nelson show for two hours before, talking, Carl, um, Chester, about Akan culture, which you know very well, having lived there. And people are amazed because we're used to hearing of Yoruba culture, but rarely do we hear of the details of the Akwesi Dai. Do we hear about the Motias? Do we hear about uh, the Obosun, and really get a piece of Archon culture and its history. And so we met in that global explosion of African royalty coming to America. Eddie Murphy can't get nowhere near this. <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Eddie Murphy ain't got that on this one. No. I, I, I would like to share with you my experience with uh, Mr. Endo. <laughs> A-S-Y Endo. <laughs> yeah. uh, I have a friend, um, I guess in 71, I made friends with this guy named uh, Kobana, uh, Kobana Anan, who turns out yeah, later. I know Kobana. Yeah. So, God bless. God. God bless. so, so Kobana, <clears throat> when Opakawari died, um, I wanted to photograph the, trans, the, the uh, transition from Opakawari to the new uh, Asante Hinte and the election that goes in between and what have you. So uh, I have my letters of recommendation from several people, one of them is Kobana, and um, I have to go see Mr. Ando to get permission to mm-hmm. do certain things I wanted to do. And it was not easy finding him or getting him in his office, the secretary to the king, <clears throat> personal secretary to the king. So finally I get to his office and I'm there to, to uh, <clears throat> request permission. I show him my letters and I'm sitting down and all of a sudden, nobody else is in the room, I thought, but all of a sudden on the other end of the room, there's this old man and old woman sitting down. And the man says to me, <clears throat> take my wife's picture. She's the best wife in the world. And I'm like, what? You know? <laughs> First, I never heard of such an expression. And two, don't you see I'm busy? I'm trying to get some work, trying to do some business here. So I look at him and he says it again. Take my wife's picture. She's the best wife in the world. And then she sort of leans into him. Oh, sweet, you know, kind of thing. So <clears throat> I'm not, you know, how how difficult Mr. Ando is. I'm not quite sure if I will, if I pay attention to this guy, if I'm disrespecting Mr. Ando in his office. So I look up and I say, uncle, which is a, ref- a term of reference in Africa for older men. I said, uncle, is this true? So Mr. Adol looks up at me. He's been hearing this while he's gone over my papers. And he says, you know, we Ashanti's have a saying. If the frog comes from the bottom of the river and tell us there's no crocodiles, we must believe him. (laughs) (laughs) So I I dropped, I turned around, picked up my camera, went over, stopped making pictures, and got they were all happy. And I come back to Mr. Ando. Mr. Ando didn't give me everything I I was wanting, but at least gave me 85% of what I was after. But that was a very um, tense kind of moment. I had no idea. He was a tough brother, but a very beautiful beautiful man. Good, beautiful man, but tough. Yeah. That same day, we went went to his house too, Chester, after we left. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he says uh, he was going to a funeral, and he's again shocked. We're here in Africa, in Kamasi, at my door. Right. So he sends the funeral on. (laughs) <laughs> and he came back with me and Dr. Jeffries for almost two hours, having drinks and everything. And then he left to go catch up with the funeral ceremony. Great guy. Beautiful, yeah. brilliant, brilliant mind. Absolutely yep. brilliant yep. Um, man <clears throat> on culture, politics, history, technology. He was just brilliant. You know? and, wow. um, and that's the appreciation you get for African people when you have relationships with them. Yes. Yes. You know, and I tell people that, you know, I, I, it hurts me when I, I grew up 
without even having been African, but ever after I started traveling in 71, I'm always hurt by African Americans who say, well, we ain't lost nothing in Africa. You know, who have, who have taken- You lost your mind there. You lost your mind, you know? And it's, it, it reminds me of what Malcolm said, who taught you to hate yourself? Mm -hmm. It wasn't you, it was, it was your enemy. And so, but when you have relationships and at Tuskegee, where I went to school, we had African students. Mostly they were graduate students. And I learned uh, so much about uh, how they saw their country, uh, what their values were and their, in the, in the music and their literature. So that the, it sort of um, emotionally put me, uh, uh, made me quite receptive, you know, for going over to spend time with my, my distant cousins. Mm -hmm. Because that's how I see all of African people, yeah. essentially our, our distant cousins. And if you relate to people like you relate to your cousins, you're okay. Yeah. But, but West Africa is unique because West Africans, especially Ghanaians, are what I call aggressively friendly. Mm -hmm unlike the Nigerians and totally unlike the East Africans. You, that's unique to them. Um, but, uh, and that's why I tell um, African-Americans if they've never been to Africa before, uh, go, to, go to Ghana. Uh, I know a lot of people like to go to South Africa, but, uh, but go to, if you go to Ghana, you have the best experience. Yeah. And what yeah, just didn't right. tell you, Alicia, he mentioned it, but he went to the funeral and photographed the funeral of the Pharaoh of a, a Fokawari, yep. the Henny, he's Pharaoh. Yep. And that funeral was something else, Chester, wasn't it? Yep. Oh, wow. Uh, from the cathedral to the <clears throat> palace, to the palace yard, thousands of people just crowd together. It was something to behold. And when they got to the burial ground of the, of, of the of where they buried the kings, that mm -hmm. particular building looks so Egyptian to me. How the roof starts and top, 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 ah, oh, incredible. And that was something else I tried to get into, but I couldn't get into. But because you know, after the after the skin falls off, they then go. the The new uh, king goes, and while the the priests wrap the bone in gold foil. Wow. But doing but doing the ceremony of the of so that everybody can come in, they actually have a way of mummifying the body yeah. Yeah. With, with with plants and with liquid. Yeah. Well, when we saw it that day, it had already been mummy mm -hmm. In Incredible culture we have. Yeah. If only we knew it. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? And I, it looks like we need to check out these books. So, okay, because you, you know, we were talking about the car, and you were like, "Oh, did you did you see this? You know, particular book that I did." Um, and you oh, know, I, <clears throat> yeah, she, when she tells me she's in Dakar. So, well, you know, I lived in the, I lived in Goree for a summer. I, my best friend was this painter, Suleiman Keita. And what I loved about living in Goree, I mean, yes, I went there first in 71 on a, when I was doing a short, uh, a week thing for Essence. And that's when I discovered Goree like everybody else does. But then I went back and then that's, I made friendships with this, with this painter and his family who lived on the island. So the day trip is one thing, but for me, the nights were also fantastic because you know, you have the you you have fewer people, uh, and walking around the island. What I love was hearing the crashing of the waves into mm. the rock. It mm. was you you have the peaceful side, which is the harbor side facing Dakar, but you have the other side that's facing the ocean, where you get all of this activity. So it was just a combination of those spirits. Uh, living with those and uh, being able to experience something that only the locals experience, and I, it was just so, uh, so rewarding. Uh, yes, being there with access to the to the with Joseph and Dye, who started that museum, uh, the the House of the Slaves, uh, was had its own um, fascination, uh, and I would go and I would just spend hours just trying to get a feeling for the place. I, uh, and, and in my book, Feeling the Spirit, which was looking at the world family of African people, I, I made a decision that on most history books about African-Americans, it always began with our uh, enslavement from West Africa. And I made a point to make sure, having been to East Africa in 73, uh, Ethiopia and Egypt, I made a point to make sure that the first chapter is about what I call our most ancient place, how we started in East Africa and then the migration to West Africa. And then chapter two 
yes, is is the water, how we are connected, how the water was the vehicle of our transmission out of Africa across the Atlantic to the Americas. And that's when I use the pictures, several pictures of Joe and Dai and the images of the, the Door of No Return and some of the, um, um, <clears throat> what do you call them? They're not gallows. What do, what do we call them, uh, Dr. Small? Uh, uh, where they held, where people were held, where the captives were held. Dungeons. The dungeons, yes. So, and for me, that was that was an, a, a statement of correcting the narrative, um, and but yet at the same time um, continuing what we knew about. Uh, and then after that, is showing how we are culturally connected, even though we in, in many different uh, places, uh, the connection from the continent. Uh, the, the ties that bind are still with us um, across the Atlantic and also with us uh, with uh, continental people who go back, uh, what I call the tertiary movements, back to the capitals in Europe. So <clears throat> it was a it was a fascinating work, piece of work that took me about 26 years to do. Wow. wow. That's but most of my projects are long term. I do short terms, too. But but the short, the, but I've, I, there's only three projects that have been very long term. This one, Film the Spirit, Ancient Egypt, which is an outgrowth of my Sacred Nile project, and Sacred Nile, which is a, 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 my first picture was 73, and my last picture is 2019. So it's about 48 years span. But, you know, I don't know about uh, I, how other people do it, but. You know, it's all based upon research, and it takes time to learn stuff. And it and mm. being there mm. makes a difference. And just trying to uh, finding out what the focus is makes a difference. Um, so, you know, mm. and then being a photographer, unlike you know academics who can just study and call people up, uh, I have to actually be there. I have to go and I have to eat with the people and live with the people and experience the re the terrain and and the, which I love, which is fantastic. One of the things, you know, being a southerner helped me in Africa is this. I'm from Alabama. So, you know, we grew up in an environment where you, when you visit people, they feed you, you eat. Mm -hmm. And you run into this culture in Africa. This is how people are. You go visit somebody's home, you know, they offer you something to drink, offer you something to eat. And I know some people are very skittish, skittish about that, about accepting food or accepting drink, thinking that, oh, my God, you know, it's going to mess me up. Well, <clears throat> there are pros and cons of that. And but if you don't take uh, if you don't take what's offered to you, uh, it's almost considered an insult. And yeah. therefore, it affects, the, it affects the bridge of trust that you're trying to establish. So I've always said, okay, uh, if it doesn't kill them, it's probably not going to kill me. Uh, but if, uh, but when I get back home, I I always go to the tropical disease specialist and I get checked out so that there's nothing lingering and uh, things you know continue. Wait, there's a tropical disease um, profess professional. Yeah. Yes. Yes. There's a tropical disease. Yes. Specialty. <clears throat> And so when I, well, before I leave for a place, I go to my tropical disease doctor, which is a world health doctor. And I said, look, I'm going here. What do I need for protection? Is there some is outbreak of anything, whatever? And I get, if there's shots, I get them. And when I come back, then I have my guts checked and see, well, did I pick up anything? And then they're able to tell you what you picked up and prescribe medicine if you picked up something and get rid of it. Because you don't want these things to linger in your body, you may not feel them, but over time, uh, the wrong thing could cause, you know, organ issues. Oh, mm -hmm. you know, I'm gonna have to get your tropical disease specialist. I didn't even, well, you know, you in New York, you, you're in New York. They have one at Roosevelt Hospital. Oh, yeah. Wow, this is I'm yeah. so this is so informational. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, I'm going to see my tropical disease um, uh, professional when I'm done, when I get back. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So, you know, eat what you want, have a good time, enjoy it. And then, you know, when you get back, you find out if there's anything that, that, that you brought back with you that, sh that, you, that your body should get rid of. And yeah. then you got to get rid of it. Because I've had it happen, and I've had to take a bottle full of big worms to my doctor to say, this is what yeah. got rid of me. Right. Right. And okay. he knew what to give me to dissolve all that stuff. Yep. 
I, I've had good luck. My worst experience was in it was uh, when I lived uh, for six weeks in Brazil, and I carried shade and everything and fresh water. I mean, it's all good stuff. But you know, things happen. Um, but so it, it was something that was so bad that I had to have two different treatments for it. One, the second one, stronger than the first. One. But that was that has never happened in any other place. Yeah, you know what? I have to tell you, walking around, like I told you before we got started, walking around and just seeing yourself, it, it's like, it's every, and everyone's dressed up, even though they probably don't think that they're dressed up, but everyone looks good. Like every, and then this thing, you know, that happens after, a little bit after four o'clock, everyone starts running. And we were at first, we were like, oh, wow, like, why is everybody running? It seems like the whole city actually goes running to exercise. It was, it was like, a, it's amazing. Like on the beach, everyone's doing exercises. And I was like, wow, like this is, we can learn a lot from Senegal. I can tell you that. Like it's presentation, really is, presentation is a serious business with Afri what people of African descent. Yeah. We love to present. Yeah, yeah, they present good. <laughs> so now, okay. But the Senegalese music is very good. Oh, and yeah. you know, the Kora is very good. There's this woman named Sanaya. Have you heard her? No. She is extraordinary. She is extraordinary. Yeah. S O N A Y A. Oh, you got to check her out. And then, you know, there's a, a well, I don't know as a woman uh, if you, well, this was interest you, but the Muslims, you know, the holy city of uh, Tuba and Bake is a very interesting uh, trip to take, uh, especially when there's not a pilgrimage because there's too many people. But uh, you'll be amazed to see this holy city that is in the middle of the desert of this huge mosque. And then in this mosque, they have these huge uh, sarcophagus of the former Caliph General. These people are the one who resisted the French. And so they have a very interesting history. And, and they, they, have, they, they also resisted the Arabization of Islam in that area. And so for years, they didn't even go to Mecca because they felt the Arabization was taken away of their African essence. You know, true, it's very true. Very African people, yeah. Our people are incredible, yeah. And then I was telling the sister that uh, Usman Simbin, I knew Usman because when I was living my first year in, in Senegal, I'm living in a village called Yaf, which was down the, uh, a mile away from where Usman was building his house. Mm -hmm. At that time, Usman was, was married to an African American woman from Chicago named Barbara, somebody, and then uh, in the middle of it, they broke up. And who's Martin refused to speak English for like five years, anybody. Mm -hmm. He knew wow. English, but because of, you know, he was emotionally hurt, he refused to speak English. But he was a great guy. And the last time I saw him, I went for Tabaski and uh, he offered he, he offered my wife the liver <laughs> of the goat, which is, you know, it was a very, very precious piece of meat of, of, of the goat. <clears throat> so now, you know, so Mr. Higgins, what, how did you even get started taking pictures because this isn't just like oh I, I like a little photography like you are committed to being to you know to capturing these images when did you start to um to go down that road okay well before i answer that i first have to say i don't take pictures i make pictures you make pictures i love that <clears throat> and what what happened is i was at tuskegee and um i was visiting this old photographer uh to have us to do some work for the newspaper and behind his uh his on, on his wall behind his uh cloaked uh, black cloths i noticed when he went through the door that these old pictures of farmers very dignified people and they were from the depression as he told me and i asked him how he did this and he he said that on weekends people will come into past his house going to the market and every now and then he would see a great character as he calls it, and he would run out after them and he would beg them to come to in, back into his house to a studio with his big uh, four by five camera to make a picture and he will offer them $5. So they may not be so much into having their picture made, but they wanted the $5 because it was extra money for them to spend at the market. So these people, <clears throat> these pictures reminded me of the people who I loved most in my life, my great uncles and my aunts. And on their wall, in my little village of 800 people, the only two things they had on their wall was one, the farmer's almanac, because it was a farming town, mm -hmm. and a picture of Jesus Christ. Mm. Photography was very expensive to do. 
I, I saw pictures of my mother because she was a school teacher. So she and her class of people had pictures, but not my great uncles and aunts, who I love more than my parents. I said, I love to be with more than my parents. So I decided that I wanted them. I didn't, I wanted, before they died, they deserved to, to feel the pride of a picture of themselves on their oh, wall. That's so nice. That validates their agency of who they are. So it took me about a year and a half to learn how to make pictures with the help of Mr. Pope and to buy the right camera that had a light meter to go home and start making pictures of my relatives. That's why I picked up the camera. Oh my God, that's beautiful. And then if I then later my, my I got hitched to the to the civil rights movement because we would go on demonstrations and to uh, we were protesting this guy named George Wallace. And we come back and the next day the pictures in the paper did not show us as American citizens petitioning the government. The photographers showed us as potential arsonist thugs and rapists, which taught me something. Not only is what's missing in the image of mass media of black people is the issues of decency, dignity and virtuous character, but it taught me that a photograph never lies about the photographer. Mm. The photographer mm. hates you that picture will show the hate. If the photographer loves you, that picture will show the love. Yeah. So I knew that the only way I, if I wanted to be here, I had a camera and I could make these pictures, but I couldn't get Montgomery newspapers to run them. But I figured that instead of being outside, having a poster saying how racist you are, make the pictures that they could not see and learn how they be good enough that those pictures come back at them from New York. Mm. That's powerful, brother, Chester. powerful. So then I came to New York. I didn't know how to make pictures. I mean, I knew how to make pictures out of, from my heart, but I had to learn how to make pictures from my head. So I came to New York the summer of 69 and I went to a newsstand and I picked up all the magazines that so, showed pictures well. And I looked to see who was the, cause my, I was studying business management at Tuskegee. So I looked to see the mass head, who was the picture editors? I called them all up. I said, look, I'm a student from Tuskegee. I wanna be a photographer. Oh, but wait, let me tell you, I'm not looking for a job. What I'm looking for is criticism because you see the best photographers. Can you look at my work and tell me the gap? And I went to several people who were met nice, but they were not teachers. And one day I was at Look Magazine talking to the picture editor, who was also not a teacher. And it was just fortuitous that this short bald head man stuck his head through the door and he gave this guy an order. I knew he was his boss because the guy I was talking to decided to sit up straight in his chair. <laughs> so he gave him his little order. He then looks at me and I have my portfolio open. He looks at me and he says, who is this? What's going on? So the guy said, well, this is this kid from Tuskegee. He wants to learn how to be a photographer. So the guy said, when you finish, send him into my office. So he looked, the guy looks at he closed the door. The guy looks at me. I look at him. We know we're finished. He said, okay, go out the door, turn right, straight down. So I walk into this guy's office and I sit down. And he said, what do you, what, what do you want to do? I said, I want to change the image of my people in the media. Well, he said, that's a pretty tall order. <laughs> he said, well, how do you propose to do that? I said, well, if I learn how to be as good to make compelling images, then one by one, it gives me a chance to, to make a difference. So he said, okay, let me see what you got. I showed him a picture. He looks at it. Then he takes four pieces of paper and he puts it on top of the picture and starts moving it around until it's like a small aperture. And he said, well, come look, look. This is your picture. I look at this picture and I'm amazed. That's a great picture. And I'm thinking, I took that. He said, yeah, you did, but you didn't know what you were taking. Mm. I said, huh. So that's when he then started teaching me he, during that conversation, issues of composition, design, balance, decision, blah, blah, blah. So I said, okay, let me go out and see if I understand what you're talking. I'll bring you uh, uh, some pictures in a few days. He says, no. He said, I will give you some film. You go out and you shoot it and you bring it back to me tomorrow and we'll process it and we'll go through it here. That began a whole summer. I knew I found the teacher. That began a whole summer mentorship. Under this man, I learned visual linguistics. Wow, because you got so many good terms. Okay, visual li linguistics. 
oh, I love this. Okay. All right, keep going. This is so, this is so <laughs> wild. I mean, I mean, I'm just like, and you're just like saying as a matter of factly, you know, like this is like a if I was looking at a movie, I would, you know, see like this movie. It's so well curated, you know, about how this happened. All right, so you went, you took your pictures that first day. <clears throat> I took my pictures yeah. the first day, and he says, Okay. I thought he wanted to see prints. He said, no, I don't want to see prints. I only want to see contact sheets. And if you know anything about photography, contact sheet is you take a roll of film and you expose it on one piece of paper and all 36 exposures come out as small one by one and a half thing. Wow. And he said, I said, well, why is that? He said, because I want to see how you think, how you develop a thought. Going from how you come into a situation, how you recognize that situation, and how you make decisions about where your pictures are, and then how you go about trying to make that picture work. Because, as he says, look, in the course of making a, 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 a dynamic photograph, the photographer has to make a 100 decisions at a, at a split second. But you can't make them all. Uh, thinking about them at, a, at, at you know, what, how do you say it? You can only make them because you solve each individual question separately so that they add up. So then you can f fly through them. So you have to make individual decisions about composition, design, balance, about behavior, about uh, attitude, approach, all those things you have to work on individually. So as you get all those things under your belt, then your mind will run through them every time you're making a picture. You will do elimination, you do whatever you got to do. But you at least know what, when I say visual linguistics, it's like a keyboard. You know, or an alphabet, you know what each alphabet does. So when we make a, when we make a sentence, we make a word, our mind runs through which letters are appropriate. So in picture making, visual linguistics is all of those solving all of those particular visual uh, decisions that are appropriate to make this thing work. Um, and then, um, <clears throat> so he was the most fundamental person to me. Then came Gordon Parks, so he knew. And Gordon Parks asked me, okay, well, what do you want to do? I told him, he's okay. If that's how you feel, then there's 36 exposures on a roll of film. When you get an assignment from a white editor, on black people and you go make that assignment, you make all of them the way you just told me. But if you slip and you make the picture that they are expecting and they are used to, they're gonna use that picture. So never give them that option. Mm, damn, that's, some good. that's good. <laughs> that's good. So they can choose not to hire me again, but if they're on deadline and they gotta find a picture, they gotta find a picture in what I gave them. And you give them all the, cho you know what? It's kind of like when you talk to kids, you need them to do something. You give them two choices and it's two of the things that you want them to do. So it doesn't matter which one they choose. Right, right. Wow. And then the next one lesson I learned about photography came from a painter and it had nothing to do with photography. It had everything to do with seeing. And that was Romar Bearden. And if you know Romy Bearden's oh, work, yes. it's about, uh, I'm, it's about um, ceremony. So Romy says to me, he teaches, Romy used to hold court on Saturday mornings for artists. You call up, you get an appointment, you come down on Canal Street, you ring the bell. He had no way to ring you in. So he would, he would up a, a raise his window and drop the keys down. So you open the door, go back and go upstairs. So Romy says, everything is broken up. Life is a ceremony, period. Mm -hmm. And you can graphic. And he gave me this example. You go to a restaurant. Let's say that you walk outside the restaurant. That's letter A. You walk in the door. That's B. You look around. That's C. D, the waiter comes to you. D, E. Shows you a C, F, G. You eat maybe uh, at uh, L. Then they uh, maybe have dessert at uh, Q. Then your check comes. And then Z, you're out the door. The, the object of this is that everything that people do is the same. If you know the ceremony, then as a photographer, you know where you want to intercept it. Mm. Mm. If I want to show someone kissing, I can say, well, do I want the attraction of the eye? Do I want a lock in? Do I want the lips locked? Do I want the satisfaction afterwards? All of that 
tells me I've grafted out, then I can decide where is it I should be to get when it gets to uh, F. What should I be when it gets to L? What light do I need to be causing it of when I when it gets to W? But because you you have now a um, a palette, it's, it's the, the thing is how do you how do you you are always making that palette work? It's almost like using a slide rule. Yeah, like this is this is uh, this is amazing. You know, I was looking through, and I promise you guys, we're going to actually get to the sacred now. <laughs> okay, we're going to look through. It finally came up, um, uh, Mr. Higgins, the um, the PDF, so we can you can you know we can you can tell me how you want me to display it. But um, these pictures are beautiful, guys. Um, but it, when I was just on, um, so we had a conversation. And let me just put this little disclaimer, disclaimer out right now. I particularly do not like Amazon to, for black books because I feel like they never give the like black artists money. But this is the only way we can actually get um, Mr. Higgins's other books. The same Earlier Nine. books. Yeah. yeah, the <laughs> other books. Okay, which the other books are, oh, you have to see the, the, the Door of No Return, his picture. Of, I mean, oh, God, it's beautiful. Um, so you, we got to go to Amazon for that, okay? But the Sacred Nile now, okay? This is your new book. And you go to my you website for that. that. Yeah, <laughs> you got to go to this website. Yes, we, we like that. We <clears throat> like your website. I'm, I'm going to put that up. Um, and while I'm doing that, can you just tell us how did you, so how did this project come about, you know? You, and it, this is amazing how you're just like, oh, I, I did this one for 26 years. And this, like, that's amazing to have that um, amount of dedication and to just stay, you know, focused on something. So how did you come up with the Sacred Nile? Well, you know, I didn't know what I had come up with until, until I discovered it years later. You know, I, um, my first trip to Africa was in 71. And I, since then, always make sure that once a year I'm in Africa. Because... Wow. Not only is it about being with my cousins, it's cheaper than therapy. And it's great being in a place where I'm in the majority and racism just sort of falls off my shoulder. People may not like me in Africa, but it's not because of what color I am. It's because of something that I do. That's so true. <laughs> that, that is so true. It's like everybody looks like you. you it's literally like, you know, I was looking at these women. They're so statuesque and, you know, they just look like me. Like they literally look like one lady. I was like, oh my God, it looks like me. Everything, you know, like, affirm, everything so, affirms you. Every, everything affirms you. Yes. Okay. All right. I'm going to try to calm down. I'm, I'm, I'm normal in Africa. <laughs> yeah, Professor Small is looking at me like, <laughs> this one. I know because he knows how excited I get about this stuff when you know because he does the same thing to me. He do dropping these little jewels and stuff, and I'm just like I can't even contain myself. But that is so true because but we want you, we people. want you young people like that. We want y'all excited, so y'all just make the trip and get in yes. there. Because I, I'm telling you, I, I I didn't know what to expect when I got here, and um, just I was just like, oh my, God. I was just staring at these people. I know they're like, what does this woman look like? You know, I was just staring at them like, this is so, it's so beautiful. So, okay. you know, the question, the question is kind of like, the question is kind of like uh, Nina Simone, you know, he don't see those, those other women. It's like, why weren't, what, the issue is, why didn't you spend all your time in Paris and London and uh, Rome and, you know, all those other cities that you're supposed to be going, you know, you're acclimated yeah. or socialized, you're supposed to be going to. No, no. Um, I, I always... I always wanted to know and, and and appreciate the fullness of being who we are. The reason I'm, I, I'm, I do what I do is because we can't, because our enemies have so distorted who we are. That's why we hate ourselves. And realizing that I, you cannot trust the enemy's uh, intellectual interpretation of who you are. You have to go, if you have the ability, you have to go find out for yourself. You, is, you always should have a healthy doubt when you're dealing with your enemy's interpretation of who you are. And, and, that, and, and that should inspire you to go and do your own research, to make your own relationships. And they're out there waiting. People are there. So, you know, it's, um, um, I've always looked forward. That was the healthiest part of my year each year is to be able to just go and and float in the majority. Float? 
God, you were just dropping all types of little stuff tonight. I like that. <laughs> in the majority. In the majority. Okay. Because we are the global majority. Yes, we are. Yes. So yes. my trips to Egypt with 73, I didn't really know. I went with uh, Peter Bailey. You guys know Peter Bailey, Dr. Small? You oh, know yeah. Peter Bailey? Yeah, Peter, he was an editor at Ebony. But before that, Peter was Malcolm X's personal secretary. Good brother. He even has a son called him Malcolm. <laughs> so Peter at Ebony was had a, uh, I was all around all, uh, in 69. I was in and out of the Ebony office and um, talking to Manita Sleet, who was their photography, who was a very helpful guy. Very busy, but very helpful. <clears throat> and Peter managed, to, there was a uh, press junket to Egypt that Peter was going on. And he says, you know, Chester, you may like this. Let me call up TWA and see if I can get you on it. He got me on it. I went there. We got there to, well, in the early in the morning. We check in this hotel at night. I'm on the like, 20th floor and there's noise as hell in Cairo. And I walk out on the balcony to look to see what the noise is all about. And my eyes are stuck on the horizon. Here is this humongous mountain of stone, the pyramid, 10 miles away that commands your attention. And I found out later that this pyramid that we see now in the seventh century, it was covered with white limestone that was then taken off by the Arabs to build, help build Cairo. They use that as a quarry. <clears throat> Here's a building, ancient building that's 35 stories high. The tallest building on the planet until the Eiffel Tower was built. Thousands of years later. So if you ever go up in an elevator and you get up to the 34th, 35th floor, look out. Because that's what you see when you if you climb up to the top of the pyramid. That's your view. Wow. So <clears throat> I'm in Cairo. I go down to Luxor and I see the temples and the humongous columns. And I realize that somehow, you know, we have not learned this history. I didn't remember the history was that what the Greek invented columns. No. The Africans invented columns. The Greeks who occupied them had the good taste to take those with them. But you see where it all come from. And you see on the temple walls, the the um, the kings. I know people want to say Pharaoh. And I and in my book, I correct that by telling people that Pharaoh is not an Egyptian word. It's a Greek and Hebrew word, but it's not an Egyptian word. The kings who were holy men. Egypt was a, was a, were a, a, a theocracy ruled in the name of God, and they were pacifists. It was the empire, entire country was temples. They invented religion. They invented the whole concept of life after death. All of those things we don't have in our Bible, because I imagine you have a Bible that were Ephesian, uh, the sixth, uh, was the fifth, cha the fifth chapter and sixth verse tells you that you should be okay with oppression, which is not what uh, which is which is not what uh, the original nature, the natural theology is about. Our Bible is the Abrahamic Abrahamic Bible, which came after the world uh, of Je the world before Genesis was the world of African religion based upon nature, where of, of all things, women were as equal in divinity as the men. Abrahamic faith took that away. So what we have essentially is we have book two and three. We don't have book one, which is the book of amen, amen. And I say amen because <clears throat> even though the people who were against our religion, they could not go forward without taking the most precious and most powerful thing in it. And the most precious and powerful thing in it was the acknowledgement of God, the ultimate God, amen. So in your Bible, you say amen all the time and it feels right because it is right, but doesn't tell you where it come from. That is mm. the, the God of the African. And that God of the African is what you left that whole book out. Mm. And, the African, yeah. and in my book, when I discovered after studying Egyptology for another 20 years, I discovered that there are three tombs in Egypt that have what's called pyramid texts. These tombs, <clears throat> two tombs of damage, but one is in pristine condition called the, the temple, the, the pyramid of Unas. And don't take my word for it. Write that word down. U-N-A-S. And Google it. <laughs> Google it. 
Unas, in Unas's tomb, you have 331 lines of holy scripture that goes from the floor to the ceiling. And in this holy scripture, it taught, and this holy scripture is, was, was, was old when it was written. And it was written in stone in 2500 BC. Damn, now add 2100 years in it, where we are now, that's 4,600 years ago. That is 2000 years before the oral tradition of the Old Testament and 2,500 years before the writing of the New Testament. So in it, it talks about creation. It talks about the king's soul. It talks about the soul of the king ascending to heaven to rejoin the, the, this, the, these, the spirits of the universe. It talks about the beginning of our moral code, which really is amplified later on in what's called the coffin text. <clears throat> but here is the beginning. Here is what the God of Amen stood on. And this is what has been left out of our, our Bibles because our Bibles that we have now, I'm not telling people that, 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 that uh, to not believe in what they believe in. I'm saying that what you believe in has a foundation. And if you understood that foundation, that would probably help you to, to uh, sift through better what you're sifting through in, in these, uh, in these um, text because what we're getting out of the Bible essentially is a, a testimony of people's memories, which are kind of interesting because if you look at the testimony of Jesus, this was written 300 years after he supposedly came and went. So, you know, you have to wonder how, you know, these, how accurate these testimonies are. And then you have to understand that the Bible may be the word of God, but it was edited by men. So and the biggest, and the, and the biggest the, the head trip on all of us is that you cannot question the word of God that was written by men. Mm. And you know, uh, if you look at it, uh, the word of God did come to Moses, but it didn't come to him in Hebrew. It came to him in lightning. God always speaks in nature. So this is why the Egyptians wait, was wait, 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 wait. wait. God, oh, wait, what'd you say? You said God um, always acts in nature. Wait, God always it? speaks to us in nature. God always speaks to us in nature. Good. Okay. Dr. Small, he, can, he, has, he has a way of saying it. This may be better than my way, but. No, no you're, you're right on it, brother. I'm, I'm just absorbing. You're right on it. Actually, <laughs> that's what me and Carl talked about for two hours. I'm just sitting there going like, wow, did y'all watch the Carl Nelson show? <laughs> Wow. So you know, almost, uh, just framed uh, the way you framed it. I go like, wow. I'm even talking topic. We talked about the the pyramid text. We talked about Hosea. We talked about the Bible. We talked about if Christianity is an African baby given birth to in Africa. You know, take it. I mean, it's like this is amazing to hear you just continuing that dialogue um, and this is what you see and i show you the evidence of this in my pictures because it's very easy for dr smalls or anybody else to tell you this and in your mind you're like oh well you know this is something you know, huh but it's one thing when you see the evidence and i have gone to the places and antiquity sites this book is about the river sacred nile it's about the water and how the water connects us all to time and to our realities and interpretation in relationship with nature but it's also about stone because stone is the, is the is the element or is the form that our ancestors used to write down the messages for the future because they knew one day we were going to lose all uh, all uh, all knowledge of who yeah. we actually are. Yeah. The stone yeah. is there and the stone has been there and it's taken thousands of years for us to be able to first to read the stone, to re-unlock the voices and to re-get acquainted to ourselves. Let's take a look at, you know, who's the most famous African man in the world? King Tut. Almost a hundred years ago, he was found, 1922. 2022 is a hundredth anniversary. Do you realize that King Tut had a very small tomb? Small compared to other tombs. And I show you different sized tombs in this book. 320 grams, uh, kilograms of gold. 
on today's market, that's almost a trillion dollars. Wow. And his tomb was the smallest. Right. Oh my God. The so smallest. The smallest. It was so, nothing. Okay. Almost a trillion dollars. And I show you in, in the in the book, King Tut in his golden coffin of eternity. Three coffins inside of each other. So let's okay. go to the book. You okay, yeah, that's the book. <laughs> you know, that's I'm just like, yes, you took the words out of my mouth because I'm like, where do we start? This so is this bad. is a picture in 1973 in Egypt. Oh, now, wow. those of you who know anything about Akhenaten, you may have heard the word Akhenaten. He's the father of Tut. Mm -hmm. Akhenaten built a city, Akhenaten, at a place where he said that the sun rose between the, the mountain in like a, uh, a, a rose out of his pillow. So here you see this image. I'm just my first time just talking about it. But those who, my images, if you deconstruct them, if the, it depends on how much you know what you're looking at, how much you come away from. You don't have to know anything to enjoy them and to appreciate them, and that's fine. But if you know more stuff, you have you see more stuff. So, okay, okay so let's go, let's advance this. Okay. <clears throat> um, okay, wait, let me, because I had, that was just a, one picture by itself. So you- Now open up the PDF. Okay, yep. I got the PDF open. So where do where do, where should I start on this PDF? Because well, I've been sitting you here. Start, where you, you can start at the beginning. We'll we'll just pace it very fast. Okay. <clears throat> wait, wait, wait! You gonna show us the whole book? No, I'm not. We're gonna oh, go okay. through <laughs> several things. <clears throat> this but this is this this is from the from the necropolis, royal necropolis, which necropolis means a big burial ground in in Nubia, a narrow way. But the next page is important. This is the holy family. The holy family of Amen, of Amen. Amen is sitting on the on the on the seat, and he has these plumes above him. Now imagine these plumes are made of gold and how much they would shine light back at you. A person walking around, something dignitary walking around with a head that reflects sunlight, the gold of those plumes. It's like two antennas of gold, two antennas of light. Behind him is his son. And behind the kneeling king is his wife. The holy family was a is all you cannot have a family without a man, woman, and what and, and, and a child. But you definitely can't have it without the woman. So when the patriarchs went and said, made the woman, they robbed her of divinity and made her a ghost. Mm. Not only did they do that, but yeah. they did, but they they did not such nonsense about trying to say that the man gives birth out of his rib and not the woman. So you know you're dealing with you know you're dealing with, with some form of sickness. This is why the Bible and those people who follow it have a certain allowance for sickness in people's behavior. I mean, how else would you explain a man who the, the Abraham who heard voices in his head and that made him want to kill his son? Excuse me? This is so I mean, what what kind of what kind of what kind of silliness is this? Okay, let's go some more. So, but on that same page, go back again. And out of respect for the people we're dealing with, the book Sacred Nile is written in glyph as well as Amharic. Oh my God! Wait, how long? Okay, you okay? Okay, how long did it take you to once you? You, you said these these images were coming to you and you sat down to actually piece them together and to do, to do this. How long was that process? Well, you know, there's several processes. You know, in fact, I shot from 1973 to 1993 in black and white. And then I took my son with me because he was having trouble with the school and wasn't listening to his mother. So I figured, you know, I had six a six week trip ahead of me of Egypt and Ethiopia. And I thought, Okay, he won't talk to anybody. I'll take him on this trip. He don't speak Arabic, so he got to talk to me. He don't speak Amharic, so he's got to talk to me. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. That's what's up. That word. So, yeah. so at one point, my son says to me, after he's been through museums, he's seeing a lot of stuff. He's young. He's 19 or 20. He said, Dad, he said, look, <clears throat> why don't you shoot color? You know, black and white doesn't show the color. It doesn't show, you know, how beautiful stuff is. You know, I'm a purist. I'm so I'm shooting black and white and I'm looking at him and I'm thinking, well, you know, first of all, I had to find somewhere in my heart not to choke him. And then secondly, I said, well, maybe, you know, the young people just may have a point. 
So then I just had to start shooting everything over in black and 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 black and white and color. But luckily, the first trip I was shooting color slides, so I had some color to build upon. But then I had to essentially start over. But it but at ninety three I knew what I was after. Whereas between seventy three and ninety three it was evolving. But in ninety three I knew exactly what I was after, so I could hit the ground running and just keep applying all of this. Uh, looking essentially what I was doing is I was looking at time over a 5,000 year period. I was looking at the, uh, <clears throat> not the graveyard of time, but the junk pile of time. And somewhere in that junk pile was a necklace, but the necklace had been broken and the bees to that necklace had been thrown all over the junk pile. I had to figure out what the necklace should look like and I had to figure out where were the different pearls that should go on that necklace and then eventually put it back together. That's what this has been all about. So let's go some more. This is to show you that Egypt, this is a now, how the now brings life. Water brings life. Nature brings life. Nature gives us water. Nature gives us air. Nature gives us surfaces. Nature gives us sun. But here you see the water feeding life right next to it. But a mile beyond that is nothing but death, nothing but desert because there's no water. This is a ribbon of life that is parallel to the River Nile. Go to the next one. This is a river in Ethiopia. There's two rivers in Ethiopia that feed the Nile. The main one is the Blue Nile. The other one is the Atbara. This is the Atbara. And then I just showed the, the contents and then the next one is, uh, the next page is where I, is uh, a bust of King Tut. And I talk about how uh, ancient names, explain ancient names and saying that, <clears throat> you know, we have this word, amen, that we can't get rid of. It's in everything and all of us know it's right. But you know, what's interesting about amen is that first of all, the Egyptian language is a consonant based language. They only have one or two ver uh, vowels. And they wrote amen as I M N. So we know the I comes with the sound ah, but we don't know what vowels they use for the M and the N, what's in between it. So I decided to use the E because they use so many E's in the names of their kings. But you know, amen is a one word that all Abrahamic faith uses. The Jews use it, they spell it the same way. The Christians use it, they spell it the same way. The Arabs, use it, they spell it the same way. This is the one word that has crossed centuries, that has crossed cultures, and it does not need to be translated. And it doesn't, and everybody know it only matters if it's said in that same particular way. Mm. We knew the name of God. And the name of God, amen, isn't really something that you see. It is, this, it is the power behind the sun. So when people talk about Egyptians worshiping the sun, People, oh, they're, they're pagans. These are the enemy of African religions. What they are talking about is they are saying the world, there's no, mono, 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 there's no one God, which is a lie. The one God is the God, amen. And yes, they look at the sun because the sun is the strongest force in nature. Imagine if the sun went out for a week, none of us would be alive. Everything would freeze. Yeah. So the sun to the Egyptians though, was merely the window to the residence of God. Now, I'll throw something else in there about women. Now, <clears throat> the Egyptians, you know, bless their heart, they were still men, but you know, men can get carried away with ourselves. So they had up this thing about, you know, the ini, the nine, where it's the one self, uh, uh, self developing God and under him was four different couples, which is okay. But what they didn't talk about is the fact that the sun comes out of the belly of an African woman every day. They had a concept called newt. The English spell it N-U-T, the Africans spell it N-W-T. Now newt is a, has been conceptualized as a drawing, a painting. And imagine this, the painting is of a African woman, long lean African woman, extending herself and leaning over the equator in a downward dog position. 
the downward dog position of yoga? Yeah. The ones that she's leaving else over to. the equator, not the north and south pole. She's leaving over the solar poles. The sun, her, her arms are stretched to the west. That's what she receives on the runway of her arms, the setting sun, and it enters her body. And her body, because she has a dress, a diaphanous dress that has holes in it, it becomes the twinkling of the stars at night where the sun is regenerated. And because her feet are on the east, in the morning, the sun, she gives birth to it. Yes. Out of the darkness, only out of the darkness of the body of an African woman comes life. Yes. This is the Egyptian concept of newt. This is a concept of continuity. This is a concept of the supremacy of the woman. And this shows again how Genesis got it, they got it all wrong. A, woman, a man cannot give birth. That's the one thing that we men in, 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 inside really are, uh, how do I say, jealous or despondent about. Not only can we not return to the thing that gives birth to us, but we ourselves cannot give birth. We can only destroy it. We can't give life but we as men can destroy it. Mm. Mm. So let's go down some more. Then you see, you see the, 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 the Nile River beginning his 4,000 mile trip down to Ethiopia, I mean to Egypt. 85% of the water that reaches Cairo, that reaches the Mediterranean comes out of Ethiopia. How did you get this picture? Like, were you on land or were you? Yeah, I was on land. I went back several times using different lens, different times of day. Back in, I went to Ethiopia. My first trip to Ethiopia was 73, 74, 75. Then I stayed away during the Derg and I went back in 93. And then <clears throat> from 93, I spent 16 years, each year, six weeks in Ethiopia putting 6,000 kilometers on my on the cars to travel around the country, documenting the culture and the place and the history. Let's go to the next one. And this is interesting. The Egyptians were very much taken with the, with how God gave them the river, God gave them the water, Hapi gave them the water and water gives you life. And they were also astronomers and they felt that the water was reflected in the Milky Way. The cosmic Milky Way was a replication of their earthly Nile. So then when I found this out, I went to start looking for how to make, what does the Milky Way look like in a photograph? And I had to learn astrophotography. First, I had to learn with a telescope, the night sky, to learn out where things were and how do you find them. And then astrophotography to figure out how do you shoot it and how do you bring it bring it into reality. And then I had to learn mountain climbing. <clears throat> what? So I, so I did yoga. For, so I did yoga for like 15 years to just strengthen me up. This picture is made out of mountain. That's, this is this mountain is 7,400 feet high. Wow. And I learned that in Africa, and you may see when you look at pictures of Milky Ways. On, on the computer, let me tell you something about the Milky Way pictures. Every picture you will see, the Milky Way is perpendicular to the Earth. That's how we see it in the Northern Hemisphere on, and the Southern Hemisphere. Only on the equator is it parallel to the Earth. Mm. Wow. Okay. So that's how the Ethiopia, I mean, the Egyptians look at the moon, and that's how they came up with the holy bark, with the what you choose call ark, them is the holy bark. The holy bark is nothing but a replica of a quarter moon. And only in the equator does a quarter moon rest on its side. Northern and Southern hemispheres rest on a point. So on its side, it looks like a boat in the heaven, a boat in the night sky. And then on this, this little picture over here of these skeletons, the skeleton may not seem that important to you, but you know, that is the oldest African woman in the world that we know about. Wow. Where should we where, where this, this picture? This is a fossilized skeleton of Lucy, who they call Lucy in the sky with diamonds. Her the yes. Egyptian the Ethiopians call her Dinkwanesh. You are a wonder. She's at the Ethiopian National Museum. 
This is her fossilized bones. 3.2 million years old. Wow. The oldest human. The oldest African woman. This is her. This is this is our lineage. This is our history. Europeans keep trying to talk about, you know, finding people who, oh, they can't beat this. They can't beat this. They can't beat this. <laughs> God bless yeah. them. They try, but they can't beat it. But you didn't know that. Now when you see this book, you got the evidence. You know it. You know what it looks like. You see it. Yeah, and it's and it's, I like how you have it's not just um, pictures, but it's also an explanation. You know, so you can get this at any point, guys. You know, like you like you said, you don't need to know anything, or you can know a lot, but this is still um, it's going to serve you well. So, someone I see in the chat, you guys were talking about, um, you know, um, uh, where to get his book. It's sacrednow.com. I'm going to put that up. And so he doesn't uh, this book. Um, the re he's actually self publishing this book. And so it's going, um, I think it's, you said it's done now. It's going down the Panama Canal. Like it's coming through the Panama it? Canal. It, it should be available. It'll be available to everyone October 1st. So I okay. tell people, you know, pre-order if you can, because the pre-orders will let me know if I should do a reprint. Yeah, you don't want to. But, you, you, won't, don't but you won't get the book until October 1st. Okay. Yes. It's the worst thing to like, oh my God, you know, I want to get this. And then you forget. And then everyone did the pre-order. Then there's no books left. Then you got to wait. <laughs> Wait longer. Listen, I as soon as I seen this, I I saw I love the piece. By the way, I want to say I love the piece that um that um C did with you um on your um on your Facebook. oh yeah yeah see, that's see, nice. See, yeah, see this brilliant. Brilliant. He's yeah. brilliant, brother. He and his wife both. Yeah. yeah, right. Like right in the middle, I stopped it. I went to your little website and ordered my two copies. I was like, let me just stop this right now because I'm not I'm not going to just you know because by the time everyone starts seeing these images. And seeing, you know, it's so much thoughtful. And then to see that you dedicated your life to, you know, to this work. Like, you're not just like, let me just take some little pictures. No, you're like you're saying, you're making pictures. But you do all these this other these other things that I'm just like, this is amazing. This is amazing. Well, you know, it's, it's, as Dr. Clark says, it's our responsibility to tell our story. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you try, and you try to tell it as as fully as possible, um, and give people the information so that it's not dependent upon you to understand. Once they see it, they understand. They can take it even further. Yeah. But if I didn't spend fifty years on it, we wouldn't know what this. It would this would not be possible, yeah. and people wouldn't have the benefit. Yeah. 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 It's just like if they didn't decide that we're going to lose and, re and re forget everything and not write it on stone, we would never have it. So that's they wrote they wrote the, they wrote their thoughts on stone and they left pictures on stone. Yes, the pictures of the of the black women who were rulers, they left pictures in their pyramids. That's how we know it. Otherwise, who's going to? Nobody would know. You say, ah, oh, that doesn't exist. No, but we have the pictures of these sisters sitting up on their thrones. Mm. <laughs> All right. So let's keep okay. going. Okay. Okay, this is this is a map I had I I had it took me a, a decade or two to understand why the Nile goes north. The only river why the Nile goes north. And it would, took me years of flying back and forth to Ethiopia that I realized after leaving Egypt that the Ethiopian Airlines, and I only always fly Ethiopian Airlines, started, kept climbing and climbing and climbing to get to Addis because Addis is 5,000 feet above sea level. So then it made me start thinking, well, why is this? So I did, came back home after that visit and I started looking for a topographical map of East Africa and I discovered it. Here is the East African Trench. The Nile goes north because it's falling out of the mountains of Ethiopia. So high that that's the only way it can go. So it's, go, it's falling downhill, but downhill is north. It's north. Wow. Because you know, what's, it's falling from the bulge of the equator, going north to the Mediterranean. And then I have a picture of one of the, the uh, tributaries of the Nile. Um, and then I do here a map just to just to reinforce in people's mind where Egypt is. Mm. Yes, people talk about the Middle East, but Egypt is in Africa. You know, 
That's interesting you said that. I, I was at this event last night and um, the, the photographer I was telling you about, he said he was in Egypt and someone had said, you know, um, he's like, oh, you're an African from Africa. And he was just like, uh, are we in Africa? Right, are <laughs> and, we in Africa? Mm. Yeah, but, he's, but he was like, everybody was referring to him as the African who came well, see, from Africa. Well, see, he's Ma Malik is dealing with Arabs. Because Arabs don't like to see themselves as Africans. Mm. They like to see themselves as United Arab Republic. They see them, mm. they don't call themselves Egypt. They call it Misr, which is an Arab word for that. We call it Egypt, which is which is the English word for it. Uh, but no, they don't see themselves as Africans. This is okay, the, the next this one. Is, this is like a um, this is a teaching. So now here we have photographs in stone of this woman in the middle with the with the apron on, a big girl, just like an African woman. Yeah. She is the queen, and she is in she is in a personal audience with her God. Amen. Then we have columns from the, one of the temples in uh, uh, Temple of Luxor, and keep going. Oh. And then here you have the the valleys of uh, uh, Ethiopia, the sun rays shining into the mountainous valleys of the Simeon Mountain Range, and then you have on the on the right uh, the one of the pyramids at Giza, the pyramid of of Khufu, at sunrise. Keep going. You have a keep going past this. This is a ritual taking place. Then here we have uh, the Sphinx in the pyramid, a moonrise, uh, a temple in in Sudan that looks like a Sphinx from the side. And keep going. The water falling out of Ethiopia, falling down through the mountains of Ethiopia, heading on its way to Egypt, Sudan. Keep going. The pyramids of Meroe. Next. Yeah. And now, two things. On the right, we have an African woman who was a queen who ruled, called a Kendaki. She left a picture of herself in her temple, in, in, in the temple of her pyramid. But on the left, you have the holy city of Lalabella, which was created in the 13th century. That's before uh, all these Portuguese arrived in America churches dug out of the rock 40 feet down and from the Lasta mountain range 11 of them the new jerusalem of ethiopia and i'd gone back there back and forth back and forth and i decided to try to capture it at night because the ethiopians go to church actually around 4 30 in the morning and when the sun comes up they leave because the sun has answered their prayers the sun rising has answered their prayers for another day and as farmers, they can now go out and work. The next one. Of a papyrus boat. And I say here, there's one thing I want, I say in my epigrams, and the epigram on children in the river is that because we are born to die, we fear death, we fear time. Because we're born to die, we fear time. The moment you know we are born, we begin to die. The clock, the battery runs out at some yeah. point. Yeah. This is, this is a papyrus boat. Yeah, this is, I love this. I don't even know, what, I don't know who this, I don't know what she, this is a woman? No, it's a, it's a, it's a fisherman, oh. but you know, it's whatever you want, <laughs> and it's from yeah, the back. It's beautiful. Whatever you want it to be. <laughs> yeah, it's so beautiful because you can't see who you can't see who it is. But for some reason, right. I just feel I feel this person. This is not nice. good. Good. Is there um somebody wants to know? Is there a limit on how many we can order at once, Angela? No, there's no limit. There's no limit. You can order, you know, uh, twenty. Here's here's uh, uh here's prayer. What prayer looks like back in the 13th century BC from a tomb of Hui to okay. Ethiopian uh, Hebrews. They don't call themselves Jews, but Hebrews. They actually call themselves Betty Israeli. And then uh, Ethiopian Muslim. Guys, this is like a great um, uh, book to get for the holidays. You, you just need this book. Everyone needs this book. Thank I you. Know, it seems like, yeah, I'm, I'm always like, I feel like I'm like, uh, like QVC when I do happy talks, but it's like, we've been starved for so long 
with with not just knowing about all you incredible scholars that come on and i'm like you have to get this like you you know and i'm always like no you gotta get this you know and i get <laughs> let me tell you i get like everything i'm always i get i get everything to my colleagues i'm getting that because it's like there's no and, and and the cool thing about it you know is that you're here talking about the thing that you're you know that that um that you've created and you've literally created this for us you, you know what i'm saying like you 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 sat there you i mean you took the mountain bike the um the, the uh learning how to to climb a mountain yoga for 15 years like i'm telling you i don't think i know anybody who's as dedicated to their job <laughs> okay i'm just gonna put that out there because this is this is great this is great no i'm i'm, I'm dedicated to the mission the mission. Oh. So here we have a woman who believes in nature. And the Ethiopians say their name of their god in the sky is Waka. And the female component is Fana. So if the religion is Waka Fana, but they call the sun Waka. Wow. So okay, keep going. This is a priest, a Ethiopian priest on the left. Here are priests, a, a Nubian priests on the left in the middle, then you have Nefertari on the right. And then one more, keep going. You have the harp playing of the uh, Ethiopians and you have African-Americans who go and visit Egypt, who go back to honor the spirits of our ancestors. And down here you have another view of the churches that are dug out of the rock in Ethiopia and Lalabella. And then on the right, we have a libationist Who's preparing a libation for the for the water uh, as an offering to the to the uh, the the uh, people of Waka? Of course, their name for spirits is Ayanas. So she's preparing a libation that her priests will make to the Ayana of the water. Here you have the Pope, Ethiopian Pope, baptizing the golden cross, which then makes the water holy for uh, the ceremony they call Timkat. But on the right, you sh it shows you the, the, the fertile soil coming out of Ethiopia that went down to feed Egypt. And that will be the flood, the 40-day flood in Egypt every year until the high dam was built in 55. <clears throat> this is nice. You can tell me when to stop. I don't want to show your whole book. And here you have people, <clears throat> and here you have people who believe in Waka doing their baptismal mm -hmm. at the water. They take these bundles of green grass, which represents renewal in September 15th, which is their new year. And what Ethiopians do, actually, the, the, the they have two New Year's, the new, main New Year is September the 11th. The Waka people are a week later. But everybody put this green grass with yellow uh, flowers on their floors of their house. It represents renewal. So here they're taking it and they dump it in, they, they duck it into the water and then they take it and they take that water and they baptize themselves with it. <clears throat> so go a couple more and then we'll call it the uh, end. Okay. These are temples, one in either, on the left is a temple of Seti the first in Egypt. On the right, it's a temple to uh, Apetamak in Nubia. Um, <clears throat> So now the inside of the churches in Ethiopia, where they dug out from the rock, that's what it looks like on the inside. Mm. Wow. These, these, churches, these churches are one piece of rock. They're nothing really but sculpture. It's amazing what our people can do, isn't it? Yeah. With leadership, with leadership we're incredible. We're unbeatable. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. With leadership, we are. Yes. Yes. So that—that's—that yes. that, is that—that that should be enough to get people to see what to give yes. an idea of what's there. <clears throat> exactly, guys. But you know, I I like we do one other thing. Go to mm -hmm. the end of the book. Go all the way to the last, maybe to the last, uh, last third or fourth page, where you have King Tut lying down in his coffin of of eternity. Okay, well, you got to know. Okay, it's coming up. I got a little slow computer. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. Wow, this is amazing. So, yes, yeah, someone was asking about your other books. They are on Amazon. This is uh, yeah. Sacred Now is uh, Mr. Higgins' uh, eighth book. Eighth book. 
Okay. All right. So let me see. You you were saying which picture did you want me to show? It's a picture of a man in gold lying down in a gold casket. Oh. Oh. This is nice. Okay. All right. Let's share this picture. Wow. So it's the next to the last picture. Okay. Wait, I, I think it's the third before the last. Yep. I see <clears> it right. Can you show us that? This is what bling, this is what I want everybody to know. This is what bling looks like. This is how the priest wow. sent him. This is how the priest sent him off to eternity. Wow. Now, when this man was found a hundred years ago, he had been traveling to eternity for over 3,500 years. We intercept the, the, the grave robbers intercepted him. And I tell people, look, you talk about going to heaven. We invented heaven. We invented religion. And if you want to go to heaven, I'm you must realize you got a queue up behind African people. <laughs> Absolutely. But you won't know that unless you know that there was a world before Genesis. If there was a world before it Genesis. All, where it all came from. Wow. This is this is incredible. You know what? I am so happy that you came to um, to show us this book, Mr. Higgins. This is really, this is oh my God, this is this is nice, and I can't wait to see your uh, your other books. I don't want to buy them from Amazon, but you've already told me there's no other way I can get them except from Amazon. So we're gonna go ahead and, and get them from Amazon. But all the ones you do, you know, after say denial, okay, make sure you're self published. Good. Yeah. 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 I, I want to do another one just on Egypt called Divine Presence because people don't know that yet. this guy was a holy man. To call him a pharaoh or a king does not give him justice. And what's left behind is nothing but testaments of people who were very holy. Holiness is what it was about. And that is a book that hasn't been done that I that needs to be done. The mm. see, because the whole thing is about reclaiming our sacred agency. We invented divinity. We invented sacred agency. And then yes. it was taken away from us and it was brought back to us by the colonizers who brought us the, the slave Bible as missionaries uh, that had been so uh, corrupted that, you know, yes, you know, we, we, we hang on to the truths about human nature in it, but, that, but those truths are caught up in a, in a whole web of, of, of religious colonization. Yeah. Yeah, this is, um, this is, this is beautiful. This is beautiful. Um, okay, Sacred Now, um, someone is asking, it's Sacred Now, let me put that back up here so everybody can see it. Um, the name of the, um, the website, you go to sacrednow.com. Okay, so listen, you guys got a lot of stuff to do. I'm talking to you, Hoppy, uh, happy viewers. Okay. One, you have to get the book. <laughs> okay. You got to get sacred now. And I'm telling you, if you go to Amazon and you start looking around, you're going to get some more, um, of Mr. Higgins's books because they are, um, they're beautiful. Just, just looking at the cover. I mean, it's, they're, they're beautiful. Um, also, you need to go to happyfilm.com and check to see if we're in your city so you can roll up on us. Um, cause Chester is in, you know, it's so funny because like my kids have seen Happy Poppy like 8,000 times. And so they, but it's like somebody may say something. And so it's like, they remember sound bites. So they always talk about you when you're talking about the chariot. And we're seeing those images of the, um, of the, uh, you know, the chariot. So the, today, the Hicksos, the Hicksos chariots. Yeah. So I was telling them, I said, Hey, um, I was like, you know, the chariot guy is going to be on, um, happy talks today <laughs> because you know, they just know, they, they know, you know, they're always listening to these, uh, you know, these things that you guys are saying. And, and that was, a, you know, know, that was the, the history of our brilliance of how, you know, people who were run out of town and defeated mm -hmm. came back and figured out a way to overcome, uh, these, these, uh, ramming chariots and make their own uh, um, chariots so as, as to, to defeat them. Yeah, 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 this is- this They is took amazing. warfare to another level. Yeah. Oh. It's kind of almost like the, what is that story in uh, ancient story about the Persian army and the, and the smaller boats that defeated them? Or was it a Cyprus or Cyrus or something? I forget the story. 
but there was a story, there was a battle, a sea battle, where you had all these huge ships and they were outmaneuvered and, and defeated by uh, an, uh, another navy with smaller ships. And the Egyptians did the same thing. It was just, just outmaneuvered them. Hmm. So Agmosis. You know, Agmosis, yes. So someone's asking about your social media. You're you're on Facebook. Are you on Instagram or anything? No, yeah, I'm on Instagram. I have two things on Instagram. One is Sacred Nile and one is Chester Higgins, uh, number 12. Oh, okay. Let me put those down. Okay. And I'm on, uh, what is that, LinkedIn? I'm on LinkedIn. Okay. And is it the, is it the number symbol or is it just 12? 12. Chester Higgins, 12. Okay. That's IG. And then yeah, you're on Facebook under your name. Yep. And then the Sacred Now uh, Instagram. Yep. I know. Everyone's like, wait, I don't, I don't think I know Chester Higgins. You know him tonight. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know him tonight. And you know him if you were looking at, if you've been uh, seeing um, uh, Happy, you know Chester Higgins. But you probably didn't, you whoa. I'm sorry, but you probably didn't know all of this about Chester Higgins. <laughs> That's the other piece. And you got to watch the piece that Tahuti Films did on him. So um, I saw it on his Facebook page. You know, you can see it. It's and, on uh, he, and I have it on the Sacred Now page on the videos. Okay. Uh, Tahuti did one, um, but he did two. Because he did one on, on the book, and then he did one where I did like a, a, a survey of why I did what I did with eight books. And then also on that, we have a, a minister talking about from the pulpit um, um, uh, from Abyssinia Baptist Church, but talking about the importance of this book. And then I have a, a interview I think I did with uh, uh, a, B, a BAI, Harriet. Harriet um, oh, um, Harriet, is that Harriet Cole? Harriet? I know who you're talking about. I see her hair and everything. Yeah, yeah. A, a, a picture of her. Um, yeah, so you guys, just, you can get all this. Yeah, stuff. Harriet Cole. Yeah, so you, you have about four or five videos on this Sacred Now site. Two of them that was done by Seed, and the other ones uh, were, were just made different by different people. Okay. Yes, everyone check this out. Okay, you know what? Um, thank you. <laughs> I, mean, I, I ain't got nothing else to say other than thank you. <laughs> Show everyone and people who didn't pre-order it you're gonna be tight i'm telling you get it now i see this book i see a lot of people getting this good you know? good yeah good. and it's I mean, listen i'm gonna be i'm just going to say this and i'm being totally honest but the price you have on this for all the stuff that you did to make this book it's like you're giving it away for peanuts I well mean, I, I want like, people to have it yeah yeah have so it. Why, yeah, so this is, you know, like we talk about this all the time. We talked about it with, you know, Dr. Renoko Rashidi. We talk about it to everyone, you know, um, that has left a legacy for us, you know, is that Chester Higgins is here. He is here for us to touch, to, you know, to talk to him, you know, to um, to email, to, you know, well, I'm just, you know, maybe not email, but you can get to him <laughs> on social media, okay? And we need to really take advantage of him being here to, you know, to still give commentary on his work. So we have to get these works. This is like the best time to be alive as a black person. You know, we have access that we've never had, you know, in this um, in this way, you know, before. So it's like, let's get these books. Um, let's, you know, it's just like our hoppy principle, uh, principle number four, teach the youth the truth. You can just sit down with your kid and go go through this book. He he has everything in the book, <laughs> you know? And so this is, yeah, it's like- Let the kids, and just let the, give them to the kids. Let the kids go through it. Like yes, I used to go right. through my mother's encyclopedias. Just go through it. Yes. Like my kids are going with us um, when we go to Egypt, when Hoppy goes in February. And, you know, I have them just like looking at stuff and they've been looking at all these images. They're like, are we going to see this? Yep. 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 Good. Still there. I'm like, yep, that's still there too. And, and you, you, do you take, have you taken them to the Met to see the Egyptian collection? Yep. In fact, um, Taki, actually Taki did a group of, um, of just kids. He Good. took a bunch of kids to the Good. net and yeah and he you know talked about it he gave the real history about everything we were seeing because the, the stuff we had written down about yeah yeah the yeah. Thing, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. He talked about it and so he was getting these kids amped so good. um and, and the brooklyn museum has a good collection too you know somebody just was telling me about that the so brooklyn museum actually has more pieces than the met 
but they're in storage and they don't display them well. And then another one, if you're looking at Nubia, then there's Boston, which has the best collection. And then Philadelphia has a great collection. So I have to say to you, my sister, you got to try that Chevagen. Yes, 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 yes. You know what? I, I, I've tried a lot of little new things. Like I was, I was sharing with Chester uh, that I do not like to try new foods. That is just, it's always been me. Like I will try anything, like other stuff. I love like being adventurous. But when it comes to food, I'm like, it's the same little stuff. So I've been out my little comfort zone here. In, in but do, but do the, try, the, the, the Chevagen is just of uh, fried fish and rice and vegetables Ooh. that you oh, can deal oh, with. Oh, I've had that. Oh, then that's oh. what the, I don't know. That's what, oh, I've had it like four times. That's oh the national God. dish. That's the national dish. Chevagen. Let me tell you, this is why all these people are just, just nothing but muscle. They run yeah. like, I, I don't know. Yeah. Like, I don't know um, audience if you were with us in the beginning, but I was um, sharing with um, Mr. Higgins that like at four o'clock, everyone gets off work and they, they run. <laughs> Everyone's just running down the street. Like they don't have no fancy equipment, but they do have like some equipment that's on the, that, that lines like the beaches and it's like packed. It's like uh, Planet uh, Fitness, but on the, <laughs> you know, like on the beach. It's like everything is packed, but everyone's just running, and it just looks like, you know, that this is like, you know, they're just like, oh, this is how we get down. It's beautiful. But and they yes, have the black dish. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. And they have yeah. the prettiest black color. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Wow. Yeah, you have to come do that. See, you know, I should have like tapped into some of these, some of you guys before I came here. You know, That's I was talking right. to, um, yeah. I, I'm how, much longer, how much longer? How much longer? How are you there? I'm here till Sunday, but I'm coming back. Oh. Like, I was just like, you know, um, this is this is crazy. I called uh, Professor Small, and, you know, first thing I said, I was like, Professor, I was like, I'm going to um, Dakar. And he was like, what? And so he told me some little things to do, you Good. know. But, Good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Good. So, you know, you guys are just running all up around. You know, uh, Professor Small, when I talked to uh, Dr. Jeffries, you know, he was, uh, he made mention of you guys like running all around West Africa. Is there any truth to that? I know you guys got stories. Well, you know, I used to see uh, Dr. Jeffries on, on the plane going back and forth from Ghana all the time. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I think he was in first wow. class. <laughs> Wow, that's that's what's up. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah, you know, that's what happens. I'm I'm so I'm so pleased. I'm so happy when I see African Americans in, in Africa. Because yeah. I know they could go somewhere else. And yeah. most of them do. And that those who come to Africa means that they are not caught up with creature comforts or afraid of themselves and are adventurous in a very healthy way. So I love it when I see them. Yeah, yeah. I try not to interrupt. I team like, Dr. Smalls, can I share this one thing about you guys? Please, please. When, when I first lived in Senegal, you know, I could not speak English and I could not speak Wolof. But I went to Senegal to sharpen my uh, nonverbal skills in photographing because you don't want to, part of photographing is not disturbing what's going on. I try to zen myself as water going over and around rocks. So and once a week, Time and Newsweek came out and I would go get it because that would be my only opportunity to feel that I could communicate in my mother's tongue. And one night I went to the, the uh, hotel, there was a hotel out uh, by the airport. I think it was called Ngor. And I thought I would treat myself and I would go and have dinner there, you know, cause I'm living with families. And I'm hearing music and I'm hearing Isaac Hayes music and I'm hearing hot buttered soul. And I fought, take my, and I take my little glass of ginger ale cause I don't drink my ginger ale ice. I mean, people don't know that, you know, it's clear with ice. It could be something else, you know, but it's ginger ale. I take my ginger ale and I go into this place and I see this brother with dress like Isaac Hayes, bald head, all this stuff on him doing hot buttered soul. And I'm saying, oh my God, could you imagine how I felt that I was going to be able to have a conversation in my tongue with somebody in Senegal? So wow. I wait for the whole concert to finish and I go up on stage and I'm exuberant and I hit him on the shoulder and say, hey, bro, how you doing? He turns around and says, come on, <laughs> oh, shit. 
Wow. Oh my God. <laughs> shit, I get it. <laughs> I get it. That's amazing. <laughs> uh, our music we got that's a whole other show is about our music and how important our music you know the music we used to do how important it you know it was how it transcended it didn't matter where you lived you know yeah it was there i mean james brown it was as popular in africa as he was here once i was on a, a flight coming from uh what was i i probably was coming from the cameroon and we stopped in lagos i didn't know james brown was on the plane in first class we stop at Legos, not to go to the terminal, but out on the park. We're parked on the runway, way out. They take James Brown off to the terminal, and there's a huge band playing. Papa's got a brand new bag. What? And then they bring him back, and we leave. But James Brown was just as big on the continent. Of course, he may not as big as big, but and he had good competition from Fela, and uh, uh, and and uh, who was the? Uh, the, the 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 player down in uh, Kinshasa, I forget his name, but you know they were big. Now you know the big thing on the continent is uh is P Square. Have you heard of P Square? No. The letter P. But do do the letter P and squares. It's these twin boys. One I think is Peter. One is Paul. They call themselves P Square. Check out P Squares. Check out P Squares videos. Okay. There's many more. Now, so Samaya is. is yeah, Samaya, I, 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 you know, she's you know she's she's clean, she's classy, you know, kind of. But you know, with the with the Cora, but you know, in my day, it was it was Miriam Makeba and Thela. Wow, 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 God, yeah, okay. Well, you know, Mr. Higgins, you got to come back. I can tell you that right now. You're already, you know, coming on back. You know, because this is like sharing your work, but just sharing your stories. This is so powerful, and I just, you know, thank you so much. Um, like, You're thank welcome. You. Thank you. Thank you. And You're professor, welcome. yeah, you know, professors like me, we just sitting here just listening, like, oh my gosh, you know. I mean, I thought I knew Chester Higgins, but tonight I've got this whole other aspect and history of this great mind and this great yes. eyes. Um, that's extraordinary work, brother, and you've covered so much. Um, especially of what people need to hear. Because some of people need to understand how we got here. Right. And how yeah. we can see ourselves when we weren't here. And you do that with the work. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And, and you're just so you're so modest about it too. You remind me of a certain director of Hoppy. I'm not gonna mention no names, but mm -hmm. he's also just like just very like, oh, oh yeah, by the way, I did this. I did, I did a couple films, you know, that's how you are when you were just like, oh, I did eight books. I'm like, wait, what? You know, especially when you are putting, you are throwing everything into these books. You know, I don't think anybody, I had never heard anyone who had to study all these different things to be able to, to bring, you know, these photos to us. Um, you know, the telescope, the, the mountain climbing, like that, the yoga, like that is, that's phenomenal. So thank you so much. Um, I know that I speak to I speak for everyone sitting here in this um, uh, chat who has been uh, feeling you from the first story that you two started talking about the uh, Sante Henty um, all the way until now. So thank you too so much for coming on to Happy Talks. No, you thank you, Sister Felicia. And see, you lasted through the whole thing. The not <laughs> bother you at all. <laughs> you know, one time, one time, you, I had to take off for a second, then I came back, but it was only one time. But I'm gonna you get did. some of that ginger ale. You did well. Yes. Yep. And I'm gonna have yeah, some more yeah. of, of the fish. The fish is good. Cool. Okay, Chester. So I'm gonna reach out to all my kids so they can order this book. Yes. Good. 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 Yeah. And uh, you uh, and, and you order a book, but also Doctor Small, you're getting a, a an autograph copy for me too. Oh, absolutely. Thank you, sir. That's, that's nice. Okay. Okay, guys. No, no, no. Wait, wait, wait. Alicia, no, no, done well. you, you brought the Are right you? person. Thank you. Wait, so I'm gonna leave you guys. Wait, 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 before you leave, you're in Harlem. Was I in Harlem? No, I mean, Doug, do you live in Harlem? No, I live in Fort Greene, Brooklyn. I'm about to roll to your house to get an autographed copy too. When they come on October first, <laughs> yeah, I'm just letting you know now. Okay. So when they come on October first, okay. you know, oh, it's, it's right? Felicia. Let her in. <laughs> yeah, I was like, look, I want my little sign autograph. That's what makes it. See, that's the beautiful thing, guys. Why the you know you guys are still here. You are creating these works 
that we love and it is um you know we have access to you and this is so beautiful so just thank you guys thank you thank you thank you thank you all right all right till next okay. time <laughs> okay that was i'll tell you right there sacrednow.com also um you guys um if you were not signed uh if, if you know if you didn't know uh, you know, that we made this big announcement about Hoppy. Hoppy is doing a city tour, the Hoppy City Tour, okay? This is straight fire, okay? Like fire, fire, fire. Um, there you go. Um, let me remove it so you can see all of, there's all the cities that we are doing. Um, we're starting off in Detroit next month and we're hitting Philly in October, Houston in uh, November, D.C. and Bridgeport, Connecticut um, in December. Now, if you guys are at a city, okay, and you're just like, hey, listen, you know, we, I really want to, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, I really want to, you know, um, bring you guys, you know, to this, um, you know, you know I mean, I'm sorry, let me just start off. If you guys are in a city and you want us to come to your city, Please, please, please reach out to us. There it is, um, infohoppyfilm at gmail.com. Um, and, you know, um, send us an email, put us in contact with someone, and we can do the rest. But um, this is going to be important because every city we go to, we're going to have a little panel, uh, a panel discussion. We don't know who's going to be at, you know, um, at these panels yet. We do have some confirmed um, people. And if you are signed up to the newsletter, Okay, if you're on our mailing list, you will get to know who's who at these cities before anybody else. So this happy city tour, this is for the film, the two hours and 12 minute film, okay, that um, we will documentary um, that we will be showing across the United States. So very, very important, you guys, um, that you support. And yes, we would love to come to Chicago. You got to hook it up. You got to hook it up. You got to hook up um, Deal the Real. You got to hook up Chicago for us. Um, yep, Toronto be a nice one. Come on, come on, line now. Hook that one up too. We just need a contact and a contact that actually picks up the phone. Okay. Um, so peace to um, our, you know, our Hoppy team that's been helping us get this together. I see um, Nafisa, uh, Series B, um, Sinet, and the. Uh, uh, thank you guys for, you know, holding us down and, and helping us get these things done. Um, I'm telling you, this is the uh, Hoppy City Tour. Hoppy is an award-winning film. We are an award-winning film now. We got like best documentary at the People's Festival. You know, we didn't even have um, a conversation with you guys about that, but um, we were awarded, um, unless you had the newsletter. See, if you got the newsletter, you would have already known this, but um, we got best documentary at the People's Festival. And so Hoppy is literally now a award-winning film, <laughs> okay? And not that we needed that, but it's nice to have. You know, so um, yes, drastic. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You guys, please, please, please. Um, you know, uh, support. We have to show up and show out. Um, you know, it's very important that we, um, you know, that we support each other in a real, in a real way. So you're gonna, you know, get to book Sacred Now. You're gonna um, come see us on this tour because, like I said, we need to see you guys in person. It's been enough of this Zoom and, and Streamyard and and all in social media. We want to see you guys in the house. It will be safe. We will have masks and antibacterial soap everywhere. Um, but come out, you know, and um, and please, please support. And the last thing, okay, is the tour, the tour, the pilgrimage to Egypt. We are going February 18th to, uh, excuse me, through February 28th. It is going to be fabulous. We are hosting the first One Africa Returning to the Source, okay, Retur Returning to the Source conference. We have everybody's up is up in this um, uh, conference. We have Anthony Browder, Dr. Wade Nobles, Professor James Small, um, Dr. Leonard and Dr. Rosalind Jeffries, Asar Imhotep, Dr. Solange Ashby. They will all be in the house giving a conversation, okay, or having a conversation with us in Aswan, 
Egypt. And so um, go to Aket Tours and you can learn everything you need to about returning to the source, uh, the One Africa Conference, which will be in Aswan, um, Egypt. It is going to be, um, you know, epic. It's going to be all of those things. And if you can make it happen, I suggest that you, you know, um, try to try to make it happen. It's um, so, yes, we're going to be selling down the Nile and we're, we're actually the only people on the ship. So it will be us selling down the hoppy. We're, we're doing a sip and paint on actual papyrus. You get to dress up as your favorite ancient. Um, you are also going to, um, we, we're going to um, have a talent show. We're doing comedic yoga. Um, so it's really important for you guys to, um, you know, to check out this. And I want to show you this um, because, you know, a lot of times when you guys contribute, you know, to us, we do a lot of, um, you know, we tend to, well, not tend to, we always support uh, our local um, black owned businesses. And there's a brother, and I'm going to remove this so you can see this logo, because this logo is beautiful. Okay. And he's done our, our happy t-shirts. He's done a lot of stuff. He's Nubia apparel. Um, but he also created just for the, the one Africa, um, just for, you know, this event that we're having. And there's the website. Look at that beautiful picture. This man just looking at the hoppy. That could be you right here. Get your little ticket. This could be you. Um, but um, I want you to check out and see. Um, you can see this beautiful logo that that he made for us. And, and that is if <laughs> I can find... Um, if I can find the, uh, there we go. There's itinerary. Okay. I'm trying to figure out why is this not working? Okay. Wait one second. We're going to get it right. But yes, it's, it's important for you guys to, um, you know, to really, uh, check this out. And if you, and, and if you guys are like on our, um, uh, website, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, you guys. I'm just a little scattered right now. Um, everything is, is, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in Africa and things are just a tad bit, a little slow with, you know, with coming up. But I'm going to show you, um, you got to see this picture. Okay. So this is the actual um, logo that, uh, that Imhotep from Nubia Apparel that he did, um, he, he did for us. So let me show that to you. It's really nice. It's so much intricacy. You know, it's just kind of like how uh, Chester Higgins, you know, there's so many like intricacies in his work that he's doing. But there you go. Return to the source. Yep, Return to the Source Conference is in Aswan, One Africa, right there. So if you guys can make it happen, Go to iCatTours.com and get, um, you know, get this, um, yeah, get your ticket. You have enough time, okay, because like I said, I'm bringing quite a few little people with me. And um, I, you know, I got to space this out. <laughs> you know, I'm doing, I know it is Aisha, it is fire. Aisha's like, it's fire. When we saw it, we, I was like, this is fire, you know, Um you know, and you can go check him out at Nubia Apparel and on IG. He has um, beautiful clothing. He just goes to 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 Kimmet and just sits there and he and he draws his designs and he comes back to Atlanta and makes them. You know, so this is um, beautiful. And I'm just getting a text from Taki. Actually, there's only four cabins left on this trip, so it's three hundred dollars just to go ahead and reserve your spot. Um, and you know, if I were you, and if you were just kind of thinking about like, oh, I might want to go get your little ticket right now, $300 to reserve. There's four cabins left. Space is super um, limited. People didn't believe us, but like the first, you know, um, uh, one that we had just went, it was like, you know, a week and it was already gone. So we have four. Yes, T.I. Yep. She's like, what? I'm like, yep. Four tickets left. You guys just go ahead. $300. It's, it secures it. And this is the thing. Anytime, you know, like I think somebody made the comment that when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. It's the same thing with money because money is energy, you know, and um, 
this is really a chance for you to, to connect to who you are. Um, and, and, and hopefully it's like the beginning, like if you've never been to the continent, hopefully this is just like the beginning, you know, um, of your, uh, your trips. And I like what, uh, what Mr. Higgins said, that he goes every year so he could just really de decompress because there you can just be black, <laughs> you know? So it's, a um, you know, um, uh, it's, it's very important that we, you know, do these things. And we've tried to keep this price down as low as we possibly can. But like I said, this right here, we have um, yeah, Anthony Browder, um, Dr. Uh, Rosalind and uh, Leonard Jeffries, Dr. Solange Ashby, Asar Imhotep, Dr. Wade Nobles. They are all going to be there giving us a, um, you know, um, you know, they make up the conference. And the thing about this conference is that this is, you know, we haven't had anything this huge in a long, long time. And so you want to be, a, you want to be part of it. And we have the opportunities to do that. And so if you put it out there in the universe and if it's meant to be, it's going to happen. But right now with the four cabins left, you need to put your deposit in at aketours.com and, um, you know, uh, and make it happen. And I, I was trying to, um, and I'm going to actually show you guys um, one more thing. And I want to thank, thank you guys for uh, the contributions, you know, that you, um, you gave to us um, today during, um, during the, um, I'm sorry, during, um, during the, uh, you know, the interview, we had so much. Uh, going on with Chester showing this book that I didn't have to, I, I'm, you know, I didn't have a chance to show everybody love, um, you know, in terms of, um, you know, of you guys donating. And like I said, this, you know, this, everything that you guys are doing, it's literally, uh, we put it right back into, um, you know, into Black folks' pocket. Um, okay, and I'm going to show you just one more picture. And then we're gonna we're gonna be out, um, so you guys can just get a visual on what this looks like, okay? And like I said, on the boat, we you know, and it's only us. Ain't nobody else gonna be on this boat except for us. And uh, we're gonna be doing um, paint and sip on papyrus, okay? We're also going to uh, have comedic yoga. Um, there's a um, a trip. I'm sorry, um, a talent show. And then we're going to have, we bring in a DJ, like we bring in a DJ to the now. See, a lot of times when you go there, there's not really like a lot of party life going on. So during the day, you know, we learn all this massive information. And then, you know, at night, we just kind of sit around looking. So right now we bring in a nightlife to, uh, to, um, to Kimmet. And so these are um, our one Africa uh, conference uh panelists and you know you never know we may be adding some more people onto this but just look at this this is like everybody and like they all know each other you know and so this is great we'll just be in egypt with them and you know listening to um to this two two day conference it's going to be fire so if you can make it happen please do guys um yep drastic's like it's going to be lit it is going to be lit and you need to be there drastic you and enoch hankerson and i'm calling both of you guys out let's make this happen all right so um, that's it, fam, um, you know, for tonight. It was very, let me see, it was very good hanging out with you guys. And so until um, next week, oh, not even next week. See, if you already signed off, you don't even know this. I'm about to break some news to y'all. So on Sunday, we are interviewing Charles Finch. Yep. Taiki will sit down with the legendary Charles Finch on Happy Talks, and that will be five o'clock on Sunday. So make sure you guys are, um, you know, um, are tuned in and to watch that. That's going to be really, uh, you know, a, a very good, very, very, very good um, interview. Okay, that's it. Peace and blessings to you. I hope that you guys have a beautiful and productive week. I don't know what we can talk about in this nation without talking about white superiority, honestly. Who defines the meaning of God also defines the relationship between economy and God. 
African Americans spent $1.3 trillion last year, making us the 16th wealthiest nation in the world. Why have we not turned those riches into wealth to develop our community?